and we are live. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream. Uh, welcome. I am joined here with Brother Justin from Christian Truthers, and uh, Rob. Sorry, <laughs> and uh, and Rob Skiba. Shabbat Shalom, family. How are you guys doing? Hey guys. Welcome. So tonight, uh, tonight we want to discuss some really important topics for the body of Christ, and it's probably a topic of no surprise. It seems to be probably the hottest topic in the body of Christ right now, especially at least in our own little world here on YouTube. So I wanted to start off with uh, some scripture from Second Peter. And what's really interesting about this, and, and please, either one of you, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any other scripture. And the reason I think this is interesting is I can't think of any other scripture that gives you a warning about other scripture. I, I just don't know that that exists. So we have to kind of, we have to realize that, you know, there's something to this and, you know, Peter wouldn't just waste his breath and, and, you know, with some empty words. So we're going to start off with second Peter three, do a quick screen share. Okay. And it's called final words. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother, Paul, also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yahusha HaMashiach. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. So, in any case, Brother Justin, you want to go ahead and get us uh, started this evening? Yeah, let me just pray for us real quick. Father, thank you so much once again for providing us this opportunity to fellowship with our brothers and sisters worldwide who seek the whole truth of your whole word, Father. Father, we pray that your spirit would be with us tonight as we discuss the things that are most affecting the body of Christ in these last days, Father. I pray that you would give us all patience and kindness and the fruits of the spirit as we as we learn from one another and sharpen each other and grow as we were instructed to in your word. In Yeshua's name, we ask all these things. Amen. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to to bring up right in the beginning uh, is something I was actually talking to my wife about over dinner tonight. And, you know, I was thinking back about the the short time that I've been involved in the online YouTube ministry. And um, ironically, both of you gentlemen uh, had an influence on my my early explosion, my early walk, you know, my my decision to even to go on online with the ministry. But, you know, I got started um, knowing that my heart was towards obedience. My heart was towards uh, what the Lord had just shown me. And that is uh, the lukewarm lifestyle I was living was um, not satisfying and, um, and only led to just continual um, pain and suffering, for not just for myself, but for my family and friends. And, uh, my, my walk, I was just so far, I felt so far from God. And so what, what he taught me and what the reason I became on fire for him again was he taught me what it means to, to really learn to love him by obeying him and how close that brings us in um, our understanding to his word and, and you know how close it brings us to when I walk with him. And that just really motivated me. And then, of course, a lot of the truth or topics kicked in and all that motivated me too. you know, learning about who we really are. But you know, I got into the ministry and I started teaching this obedience thing, this repentance thing. And sure, there's a little bit of pushback from a few of those channels out there who are completely against repentance, it seems. And but for the most part, I, you know, I experienced just a, a overwhelming support from the community at large, the Christian community at large. Um, it seemed the more I taught uh, obedience, the more I taught repentance, the more I taught the power of the Holy Spirit through his grace to to walk as Yeshua walked, the more support I got. And people were, I, I was surprised at how, how excited people were to finally hear a message um, of the power of the Spirit to cause us to truly 
uh, deny flesh and walk like him. And, you know, in doing that, I made a video where I was defining what faith is based on the Greek and the Hebrew. People loved it. I made a video defining what grace is. It's called the power of grace based on the Greek and Hebrew. People love that too. Um, but you know what? It wasn't until recently that I decided that I needed to define for myself and for everyone else out there what sin is. It wasn't until I defined what sin was until the overwhelming support was no longer there. And there was a huge, I noticed a huge division in the reception of, of people listening and watching and, and responding. Everyone agrees we can walk in the power of the Spirit. Everyone agrees that faith without works is dead. Everyone agrees that repentance is critical, critical. It's what Yeshua taught. But as soon as you define what sin is, there's a, a tidal wave, a tidal wave of attacks, a tidal wave of negativity, spiritual attacks, people just going crazy. And, um, you know, long story short, that, that leads us into where we are tonight, all three of us, I, th I believe. I'm not, obviously you guys can speak for yourselves, but we've seen, especially in the last couple of weeks, but really over the last year, just what, what was once an excitement for deeper learning, an excitement for um, walking in truth, now becoming a sort of division like I've never seen before. And it's getting crazy. <laughs> it's getting crazy out there. And so, you know, we were really, really excited and um, just blessed to have Brother Rob Skiba on with us tonight. Uh, as many of you guys know, uh, he's been a giant influence in a lot of our lives for different topics, different reasons. Um, and ironically, uh, he's getting it even worse than, than most of us are in terms of just the overall backlash uh, concerning keeping the commandments of the Most High. And so we, what we wanted to do tonight is just discuss some of the, just some of the heart, our hearts, our mindset, um, some of our thoughts. And um, I don't know, just kind of see if we can get to the core of, of what's really happening here and and uh, bring you guys along for the ride and the conversation. So I hope it's a blessing to you. Yeah, you know, um, wow, this last uh, <laughs> couple of weeks has been just crazy. And I, I mentioned it on one of the shows I was on, and I said that... Um, you know, there is a spirit of Christmas and it's not nice. <laughs> it is an ugly, scary spirit. Oh, it's fine and dandy. It's all wonderful peaches and cream. If you're falling in step with it, if, you, mm -hmm. if you're going along with it, it's, you know, what a great time, right? But the moment you step out against it, the fangs come out and um, it is an ugly, ugly spirit. So, yeah, there's a spirit of Christmas, but you don't want to have anything to do with it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if, if, if you're a Bible-believing Christian. And that's only part of it. I mean, it, it, this is the kind of thing that does come out uh, this time of the year. Uh, I have a friend of mine, we were talking offline about this, but for the sake of the audience, um, my friend Andy Hoy suggested that the Torah portions seem to manifest in real life. And in other words, like real life mirrors whatever the Torah portion is for that particular week. And for those who don't understand what I'm talking about, sometime thousands of years ago, people had divided the Torah up into a yearly reading cycle. So you go through the five books of Moses in a whole year. And as the prophets were being written, they started adding the what they call the half Torah, the, um, the prophet sections that go along with the Torah portion. And then after the uh, New Testament was written, they started adding New Testament scriptures that go along with the half Torah and the Torah. And so, you know, that's what we did on our virtual house, house church as we, for several years, went through the weekly cycle. And it's only been recently that I have noticed the pattern that my friend Andy was talking about, and it does seem to play out. I mean, when a lot of this stuff started erupting 
more recent stuff. It was about the same time the Torah portion was when Joseph was being backstabbed by his own brothers that wanted to kill him and throw him in a pit and ended up selling him, you know, off to be a slave. And of course he would, you know, the rest of that portion are, are continuing is he's mistreated in prison, you know, um, and in prison, you know, he was unjustly accused and put in prison. And that's why it really frustrates me when somebody makes fun of somebody else who's in prison. I'm not going to mention any names, but, you know, there is a prominent Torah teacher who was put in prison a few years ago. I happen to know a lot more about that story than most people do uh, because I bothered to look into it and talk to the family and talk to other people who are more privileged to have the full story. And, you know, it's just not cool. I mean, some this other pastor made fun of this person who's in prison saying he's under the law now. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, hope he gets another 50 years. I'm like, wow. So let me get this straight. You're going to make fun of our brother because he's in prison. How many times was Paul in prison? Uh, you know, uh, and we're talking about Joseph, right? I mean, he ended up in prison, but unjustly, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And what, what men meant for evil, God meant for good. And that's, uh, I believe, this week's Torah portion is the uh, the reconciliation of Joseph with his brothers. And it was weird because I was just thinking about that, this whole what we're talking about right now this morning. I was thinking about how, wow, yeah, it does seem like the life is emulating the Torah portions. And I, I thought, well, you know, this week is about reconciliation. So that was a thought that came in my head. And then about a few hours later, after I got up, I checked my email, and somebody who had been going off on me quite a bit uh, actually sent me an apology um, letter, uh, if if you can call it that. Uh, it, it's difficult when you, you read some of these things, and you see somebody's heart. It appears that their heart w was such that, okay, I want to reach out, and I want to do a Matthew 18, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but in Matthew 18, that's when you're rebuking a brother, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going to, it's like, okay. So it, it was kind of awkward. I mean, I read, the, I read the email and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know how I should respond to this, <laughs> you know, cause he's claiming that he has the one true gospel and he's going to take a firm stand on that, you know, implying that I am not believing that. And I'm like, dude, you know, I'm thinking to myself, if I respond to this guy, I'm going to have to write a book because <laughs> he doesn't understand the true gospel. I didn't understand the true gospel. No true antinomian, and an antinomian is simply somebody who believes that there's a new dispensation of grace and is, is against the law, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a preaching of the law. No true antinomian can claim to know the true gospel. You just can't. Um, Yeshua, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, it says he began with Moses to describe who he was. In the end of the of the book of Acts, we see that Paul is in a rented house, and he's beginning with Moses to tell people who Yeshua is. Mm -hmm. Right. So, if Yeshua himself is using Moses to explain him, and Paul, the one all the antinomians want to use, is using Moses to explain the Messiah, and the Thessalonians, who are in the Bereans, you know, who are searching the scriptures, what were the scriptures? The scripture were the Torah and the prophets. If all of these guys are going there to understand the Messiah, mm -hmm. and yet you have people who are against the Torah who start in the book of Galatians, they, they don't even start in Matthew. <laughs> Not, start a lot of them don't ever leave the book of Galatians either. Well, it's the, Galatians, and we should talk about that uh, during this broadcast, because they think the guys like me hate the book of Galatians and don't want to uh, you know, deal with it. I'm, that's far from the truth. Mm -hmm. I just happen to have a different understanding of Galatians than they do. Um and we should circle back around to that. But, um, you know, ultimately, how can you know the true gospel if you're not beginning with Moses and the prophets? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Yeshua said, explained him. And that's what Paul was using to explain. That's what the Bereans were looking into to confirm the words of the apostles. Everybody in the in the first century was doing that. There was no New Testament. It was in the process of being written. And as you read Second Peter there, I'm going to put a screen share up on something that I wrote back in 2015. Uh, Cause you always hear, you know, Oh, you foolish Galatians, right? I mean, if you're going to get under the law, you're a foolish Galatian. Well, I, you know, when I started looking into this issue, I saw that Peter wrote to Galatia. 
Okay, and in Second Peter he says, in, and in my first epistle, so when he's in Second Peter saying, hey, the last time I wrote to you, it's to the same audience. So when we read the end of Second Peter, he's writing to the Galatians, and he's warning the Galatians, saying, you know what? Yeah, you know, we love Paul, but he's got some stuff that's kind of hard to understand, that ignorant and unstable people are twisting and distorting in order to fall into the error of lawlessness. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's happening now. And, you know, I, I, people can read this note if they want to. They can just go on Facebook and look for my note. Well, actually, there's a, a resource that I built specifically for these conversations. It's on my uh, website, robschannel.com forward slash Ephraim dash awakening. And uh, there's a video here dealing with why I call it the Ephraim awakening, what I think is going on there. This one deals with the rapture. But just, you know, getting to the identity of the church, who is the church? And, and this right here, Leviticus 26, Ezekiel 4, and the fullness of, my, of the Gentiles is, and the redeeming the bride parts one and two. This is sort of my version of the identity crisis video that uh, Jim Staley had done a number of years ago that radically changed my life and gave me a, a, a real clear understanding of how the whole Bible works together in terms of who the church is. Uh, and then, you know, all these topics, these are notes that I wrote based on all the discussions that we're having even right now, right? Uh, and then when you get down to the commandments, the Sabbaths and the feasts, you know, uh, you know, is it important? Should we still be doing that? What's the deal with the six? Are you doing all 613 commandments, Rob? <laughs> that's the first, that's the first <laughs> comment I always get to. Oh. You know? Like the people who say that, you know, it's like they read a bumper sticker somewhere. It's like they have no clue even what the 613 are. Oh, and in that regard, there's a brand new website I just found out about, uh, the 613. Dot, uh, I think it's info. Yeah. If you guys haven't seen this website, it's like the way cool, like awesome website. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's all interactive. So like, um, it shows, you know, the two great commandments of Jesus, right? Love God, love others. That's God's holy law summed up in two. Right. Well, I mean, here are the five of the Ten Commandments that deal with loving others, and here are the five of the ten that deal with loving God. And you know, you can click on them, and then it opens up this right here. And oh, these wow. are all, these are all the numbers of the six thirteen. So, like number twenty eight is do not worship idols. Uh, in the four ways we worship God, Exodus twenty five. Right. So you could just, you know, highlight over each one, and it, it explains them, and it's, it's like really in depth. I mean, it goes through crazy uh, uh depth here and on the right hand menu you can scroll down all of these links are awesome but down toward the bottom here it it has all 613 numbered for you wow. so that's you can awesome just, you know, gonna, randomly bookmark that now yeah you just click on one and it tells you you know uh idolatry and gentile oh that's interesting idolatry and gentile customs well you know wow do not inquire into idolatry, Leviticus 19.4. That's that's number 24. Uh, appropriate for this Christmas season. <laughs> wow. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, what a fantastic resource. I need to add that to, to that page. I just found out about it. Somebody posted it as a comment to one of my threads on Facebook, but it's the613.info. Uh, so you should check that out. But uh, so anyway, I mean, these are all the various topics on on the blog, and then what's how do we deal with law and grace? You know, how does all that work? And then I've got various um, links for understanding the Apostle Paul, and it became my understanding after doing two years of Torah study. Um, it was right around getting into the third year, I think, that I realized, wow, we shouldn't read one sentence Paul wrote until we deeply understand what Paul read. Mm -hmm. Don't read right. what Paul wrote until you right. understand what Paul read, because that dude was like a he was a Torah uh, scholar. He was an attorney of the law, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and incidentally, when you if you want to let's circle back around to Galatians, if you want to talk about Galatians and the so-called works of the law, people need to look up the MMT, the MMT or four Q MMT. That is the um, designation for a Dead Sea Scroll manuscript called. Works of the law. The works of the law. Ding, ding, ding. Um, this is an interesting uh, blog that I posted on my Facebook today. Um, Hope 
dash of dash Israel dot org forward slash works law dot HTML. If you want to understand Galatians, you need to start here. Just read this first and understand that there was an actual document called the works of the law. And as a highly trained Pharisee, Paul would have been intimately familiar with this particular document. Wow. So when he's talking about the works of the law, he's actually talking about a document, not the the doing the things of the Torah, wow. but the document that was a checklist that, that the Judaizers were using. You know, I don't know if they had penis checking stations everywhere or what, but I mean, <laughs> how do you how do you know if somebody's circumcised or not, right? I mean, but you know, you know, come on, get in the penis checking station before you come into the synagogue. But wow. they had a list of things, and this is Acts 15. Everyone wants to throw Acts 15 around. Well, they always skip verse 21, where it says where they hear Moses preached everywhere on the Sabbath. Right. Um, anyway, I mean, these are the, the stuff we're dealing with. It's nothing new. I mean, I, I've been doing this since 2010, and you know, this is just a compilation of a whole lot of you know t dealing with issues on Facebook primarily. But you know, people have, can go there, and chances are, something that you're, if if you guys are into the same thing that we're talking about here this evening, and are struggling with answering stuff that people are throwing at you, this might be a resource that uh, I'm not claiming to know it all. I'm just saying there's a lot of stuff here that might mm -hmm. be uh, useful to you to help you. Yeah, definitely, cool. definitely. That's something. That's a good resource. Plus the uh, that the six thirteen dot info. That's that's an awesome resource as well. Um, but, you know, speaking of Galatians, uh, like you said, there's so many things that are taken out of context, which quite often, quite often, I know personally, I get accused when I speak of the Torah or speak of following the commandments, following the law, uh, people will accuse me of walking in the flesh and, and that, um, you know, that the, the deeds of the law are actually works of the flesh, which it's really interesting because Galatians 5, it lays it out very clearly what the works of the flesh are. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 19, the, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, which obviously all we have to do is go to uh, the Torah, which is what defines all these things as as sin. And, you know, Justin, when you, when you let off earlier, you know, the definition of sin and these type of things, which I think any any level-headed Christian knows that it's our duty to stop sinning, right? But when you start defining it is when it starts becoming a problem, just like you said, which if we all you have to do is turn to uh, 1 John 3, 4, which says that, um, you know, sin is transgression of the law, which let me just let me just put up on the screen real quick. Because we have to know the definition because every, what I hear a lot is, well, we have the spirit in us so that we know when we sin. Well, I'm sorry, you know, God's a God of order. He's not, he doesn't just willy nilly, you know, whatever you think is, whatever you think is right or, or wrong. No, we have to have that definition. Nothing's changed. We know that God is the same yesterday and he's the same today. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the, also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Simply put, simply put. But I don't know how it could be any clearer than that. No. I mean, it's, it frustrates me so bad because these same guys that, are attacking me i'm sure there's probably a lot of the same attacking you we're all about we need to repent of sin mm -hmm. and i'm over here going sin is transgression of the law right <laughs> shut yeah. up you heretic you judaizing yeah. you know it's like oh yeah you just said we need to repent of sin i'm just telling you what sin is so if we're right. supposed to repent of transgression of the law what do you think we need to do stop transgressing the law <laughs> stop breaking the law <laughs> oh man like, uh, really? Do we have to? Uh, wow. The other thing, actually, Rob, we did a um, about a month ago. Adam and I did a, a live stream titled um, "Paul, Galatians, and the Truth," and we, we were digging into the pagan background of the Galatians and how mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't have been the Torah they fell back into; it would have been paganism they they were falling back into, which explains a lot of what he's saying in Galatians. But you know, um, same in Coloss the, Colossians too. Col Colossians, yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that we hear a lot is that, um, and this used to this used to bother me a lot, and now it doesn't so much anymore. But people use, people tell us a lot that you can't, that you just cannot um, keep the law, and um, that's just something that just goes on and on. In one of the slides, actually, I'm going to do a screen share for those of you guys who didn't didn't see it. One of the slides we shared. Um, 
was this one here where and I actually did a video called unlocking Romans 8 that uh, if you guys haven't seen yet you'll, you might be interested in checking out but what it says clearly in Romans 8 and this is obviously written by Paul is that they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is at enmity with God for it is sub not it is not subject to the law of God. So pause. The carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God, dot, dot, dot. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So this is, this is saying that if you have the spirit, you can submit to the law of God and are subject to the law of God. So it's mm -hmm. it's just clear um, rational thinking there. It's like just it's 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 so interesting how and one of the things we actually did in that stream was we showed in like I think like twenty places where Paul is staunchly supporting and teaching to keep the law, mm -hmm. um, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, and on and on. Um, so it is it is just so interesting that um galatians is such is such a go-to book when most people quoting from it have taken very little care in actually understanding the context absolutely and that's usually the go-to i mean it's just you know go read galatians like oh, okay <laughs> yeah like that's the only book in the whole bible and i have a better understanding of galatians now than i did before when i was on that side of the fence also mm -hmm. but let's say I was still on that side of the fence. I would have to think to myself, does one book trump the other 65? Right. No. So it either has to be an agreement with the other 65 or it has to be thrown out. You, you, one book is not going to trump the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I happen to believe it's all an agreement. I think it's all, you know, very harmonious. It's all working well together, you know, but, you know, if, if it if and the same thing with Paul, if if Paul is contradicting every other author of Scripture, then he fails the Deuteronomy 13 test and needs to be thrown out. Right, right. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in the Torah community that are doing just that because they didn't take the time to study out what Paul is saying and they don't know about the MMT. I mean, just looking into the MMT alone will clear up a huge amount of uh, deal well, with with Paul. I, I can even empathize with a lot of people because if you don't understand the context, if you don't understand the paganism that the Galatians were involved with, if you don't understand the circumcision party and the gospel that they were preaching, which was a salvation through the snipping of the flesh, then Paul is hard to understand. But that's why I really wanted to start off and make the title tonight, you know, Peter's warning, because again, guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there any other scripture that warns about other scripture? I, I can't, I can't think of any. So we have to take that warning seriously, you know, especially from, from Peter, you know, I mean, of all people, we, we, we've got to take that warning. And so, like you said, it, it, it does one book contradict the rest of it. No, absolutely not. We have to, we have to dig in and I'm really thankful for 119's uh, work. Uh, three, four years ago, I was at a crossword crossroads where a lot of people are right now. I, I've got a lot of messages, a lot of emails. A lot of people are like, well, you know, a lot of things you guys are saying make sense. And then, you know, I'm hearing, you know, the other side and it kind of makes sense too. And then you, then I read Paul's letters and it's like, ah, so confusing. You know, I, I do highly recommend the Pauline paradox series because I almost went the route that a lot of uh, a lot of people in Torah, which is rejecting Paul. I almost went that route because I was reading for what it said, and I was like, "This doesn't make any sense." You know, I just I can't imagine that. You know, because what I did when I when I first came back with all my heart and all my soul, I read you know from cover to cover, and so when I finally got to Paul, I'm like, "Well, this, this doesn't make any sense." I, I, why has it always been about this and always been about obedience to God? I mean, even at the back of the Garden of Eden, Garden of Eden, you know, obedience to the Father. He didn't get it. The Israelites came out of out of Egypt, which again, a lot of people say the, the law is bondage, but how much sense does it make for the Israelites to be rescued out of the house of bondage and then put into bondage? It doesn't make any sense to me. And our our father's not a, a father of confusion, an author of confusion, you know. It, it, just the whole time, you know, what did Israel get uh, dispersed for and divorced for? You know, breaking the law, not not following his commands. Here he finally sends his son, and you know the parable of the vineyard, right? The parable of the wicked tenants of the vineyard. 
what did he say? You know, in, in that parable that, you know, and he'll be he'll give that vineyard to a nation that will bring forth forth fruits in their due season. What the other tenants didn't do before, and so it just never made sense to me that you know here we are, we've been redeemed, we've been washed, and then jump back into the mud. You know, like Peter says, like like he warns you know else elsewhere. You know, don't fulfill the proverb that says you know a dog returns to its vomit and a, and a, a pig or a sow returns back to wallowing in the mire. Like, and that to me, going back to in filthy ways and not, you know, not keeping our father's commands, which is holy, which is righteous, which is good all throughout all the scriptures. It just never made any sense to me. So, you know, for anyone that's on the fence, you know, I would highly recommend it's called the Pauline paradox, uh, series by 119 ministries. It really brought me back from, from the direction I was going and, uh, made me finally understand Paul and my faith was greatly, greatly increased. Yeah. Amen. My wife, we were reading, um, the passage where the woman uh, who was caught in adultery, right? And, you know, the whole deal, you know, they're accusing and Jesus said, you know, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone, right? And, you know, everybody walks away. He says, you know, where are your accusers? She says, I have none. He says, well, I don't either. Then go and sin no more. And uh, Sheila says, you know, what if we just replace the word sin with the definition that you read earlier, First John 3, 4? I thought, what a brilliant idea. So uh, I wasn't thinking so much in that specific passage, which obviously in that case was the sin of adultery. I was thinking more of Paul because Paul preaches against sin a lot. So if you look at all of Paul's writings and everywhere he speaks against sin, replace that word with the definition. And you'll see how many times Paul is saying not to transgress the law. And so if you're going to use Galatians and if you're going to use anything from Paul, okay, get Paul to agree with himself first. After you do that, get back to me. You know, mm -hmm. should, should we therefore transgress the law so the grace may abound? See how that works instead of sin? Right. God forbid. Right? Right. I mean, just do that with all of Paul's writings and you'll see, okay, clearly I have to rethink Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, if you come from that mentality, right. either he, he, he's crazy even agree with himself he's speaking out both sides of his mouth or he has a different understanding than we do and we better heed peter's warning and figure that out so that we don't fall into the category of ignorant and unstable men who are twisting and distorting his writings and falling right. into the error of lawlessness right right yep yep yeah that's you know that brings me to another example um which is commonly brought up and this has been going on you know since ci schofield in the 19 early 1900s with yeah. the pamphlet he published called rightly dividing the word of truth uh -huh. uh, which started that whole you know you know yeah of course he wasn't the first one and i got a video on that too um but rightly dividing the word of truth um second timothy what is it i think 315 or something like that i don't have the top of my head it's funny when you actually take the word, um, the, 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 the scripture they're using and go to the Greek on what rightly dividing the word used there, the root word there is orthos, which means to lay a straight path. And when you actually look at the other scriptures that use that word orthos, it's always in reference to a pathway that's straight from one place to another. And it never, literally it never is used to talk about uh, slicing and dicing things. Mm -hmm. So the irony of it is um, they're using that verse to slice and dice the scripture, but they're not rightly dividing that very verse themselves. And it's just, it's, it's painful to watch, but it's, you know, I, I can't believe that that's still, people are still actually listening to that being used so out of context in that, in that way. It's well, crazy. Uh, it's, 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 it's blindness. I mean, we, we should, sorry, sorry, Rob, just to say, we should, we should know better coming from, learning about the biblical creation model and, and all that, all that came with that, knowing, you know, showing people the evidence and there's just like this veil of, that people just can't see past. Um, you know, it, it's just no wonder that that happens, but, but real quick, Rob, let me just, I just want to touch on rightly dividing real quick. Uh, Justin, I don't know if you saw that post that I posted the other day uh, about rightly dividing and about mm -hmm. the usage of that word. I want to uh, just read this real quick. Um, this will take me just a minute, Rob, and then uh, then the mic's all yours. The key to evaluating the two views is to well, the two views was one is you know one continuous story and the other is you know chopping up the chopping up the Bible to suit the the uh, um, the agenda. 
the key to evaluating the two views is to look at the original language of 2 Timothy 2.15. And this is what we find. The word that is translated rightly dividing in the Old and New King James versions and in several others is a single word in the, in the Greek. It is a form of the Greek verb orthomeo. This is a very interesting word. In New Testament times, orthomeo was primarily a civil engineering term. It was used, for example, as a road building term. The idea of the word was to cut straight or to guide on a straight path. The idea is to cut a roadway in a straight manner so that people who will travel over that road can arrive at their destination directly without deviation. Orthomeo was also used as a mining term. It meant to drill a straight mine shaft so that the miners can get quickly and safely to the mother load. There is another word in Greek, katatomeo, which means to cut into sections, but that is not the word that the Apostle Paul under divine inspiration uses here in 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul is not talking about rightly dividing in terms of dissecting the word of God or cutting it into sections based on Jew and Gentile or Israel and church or any other criterion. It's interesting that the apostle Paul does use that word katotomeo in cutting up in Philippians 3.2 where he says literally, beware of those who would divide you up. In other words, beware of those who would try and make a difference among believers between Jews and Gentiles. So, sorry, Rob, I had to just put that in there real quick, right, when we were on that topic. Interesting no, I, stuff, you, though. Absolutely. I've, you, you actually said some of the things that I was going to say. So, Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, no, it's all good. We're tracking down the same path. So, I mean, that's confirmation. But this is just one of the reasons why, because people ask me all the time, what, well, what Bible translations should I use? And I say, I'm not an advocate for any English translation as a singular source. Uh, I'm a huge advocate for what parallel Bibles and for tools like right here. Uh, this is biblehub.com. You know, anytime I'm reading, if I'm just casually reading, yeah, my default is King James, but I actually have a uh, King James parallel Bible. So in, in the one that I have is King James, which claims to be a literal word for word translation, which is a bold faced lie. How can you say it's a literal word for word translation when you don't literally put the name of God over 6,000 times in the Bible. Wow. You use generic titles like the Lord when yod heh vav -Hey is there. That's right. not a literal word for word translation. That's number one. Number two, um, no English translation is, purpose, uh, is perfect. So right. that's why, because it wasn't written in English, and therefore all English translations are subject to translator bias. And there's a lot of it. And I don't care which one you're talking about, but that's why I, I suggest that people have multiple English translations to compare. And that's why I love resources like this. There's other, you know, soft eSword and the Word and different uh, Bible software tools that you can get, you could download for free that will give you multiple translations so you can look at them at the same time. And, and most of the time, the words the, between translations are pretty close. I mean, you get the gist no matter which translation you're looking at. There are some, however, where the, the, it's vastly different. And you're like, whoa, what's going on here? And in that case, you, the way I look at it is like, well, okay, I mean, why did these different English translators go so in completely different paths? You know, with this, and then you look into the Hebrew, you look into the Greek, you look into the Aramaic, and you know, a website like this will give you those tools. But if you look at most other translations, you know, the Schofield and all that stuff comes. I'm just gonna say it comes out of King James only ism, mm -hmm. which uh, you know, I'm just I'm sorry anybody out there who believes this way, but I, I'm just gonna say it. King, KJV only is a cult. There's no other way to look at it. And there's a uh, uh, Ken Hoven has even gone so far as to say he's hardcore K KJV only. He went so far as to say he would correct the Hebrew and Greek to the King James Version. Wow. That's just wow. insane circular I, reason. Crazy. I lost that 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 thought when I looked at the at what, Acts 20, verse 7, you know, the first day of the week, Sabaton, the week. whole ordeal. I'm like, okay, never mind. <laughs> well, let's see. Look, I grew up King James only. I know every argument. Okay, so spare me. Anybody out there is listening and wants to go psycho on me. I've heard every argument. I, I grew up in it my entire life. It's my default translation. That's where all my memory verses and stuff are. But, you know, in this case, KJV is the one that, that comes out with rightly dividing. So, you know, these people will come out and say, well, see, that's what the big page is between Malachi and Matthew. It's divided. We are New Testament Bible-believing Christians. You know, and so you have this in dispensation. Paul has been given this dispensation, right? So they'll say, well, see, there's a dispensation of grace. Well, if you look up that word, it just means administration. He is dispensing information. 
You know, it has nothing to do with time periods that have been rightly divided. So here's an example where you look at 2 Timothy 2.15 in multiple translations, and you'll see, you know, correctly handles the word of truth. Be not ashamed, you know, to, to be ashamed of who correctly explains the word of truth. Rightly handling the word of truth. Accurately handles. You'll see this accurately handles is the dominant translation. Of course, King James goes up with divided. But, okay, so you look through all these, and most of them will be talking about correctly teaching or correctly handling the word of God. Uh, teaching the message of truth accurately. Okay, so then you go look in the Greek, and that's where you find, you know, a resource like this that, that has the English here, has the Greek word there, and the word that you were just talking about there, uh, ortho, what is it, orthotomio or something like that. Okay. Uh, cut straight, correctly, handle correctly, teach rightly. You know, that's what it's talking about here, accurately handling the scriptures not grossly manipulating, distorting, and twisting them to fall into the error of lawlessness by pretending there's dispensations. There's grace all over the Old Testament, guys. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. Uh, it's all over the Old Testament. And why? Because you can't have one without the other. They have to go together. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's always been that way. It's not like it just magically grace showed up with Jesus. It's always been there. Yep. 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 Amen. Yep. And actually, that that's a good point, too, for those of you who, who may not have studied, uh, you know, the actual biblically defined ver um, understanding of what grace is. And it's it's funny because I actually, uh, like I said, I, there's a video called The Power of Grace. If you guys are interested in checking that out, it dives into the Greek Hebrew of what grace is. And um, to really to really simplify it, grace is the power of of the spirit given to us to walk um, in a holy, righteous, set apart manner. That's what grace is. It's endurance to endure the trials of this world, of this life. And it's funny actually, because uh, just today I was randomly, I was taking a shower and I was getting out and I was just thinking about all, all kinds of stuff in the shower, like we always do. And I, um, I asked my phone, I did one of those, okay, Google things, which I've been scared to do, but I tried it today. I said, okay, Google, I said, define grace. And it, it actually answered me. And I was like, man, this is scary. But <laughs> she said, um, grace, she basically said that grace is um, uh, elegance and um, like the ability to move smoothly despite um, like difficulty. Interesting. And I'm like, well, <laughs> Google knows what grace is better than most people because most people just think grace is, is a big hug and it's mercy. Well, grace and mercy are actually both used. Both of those words are used together, mercy and grace, grace and mercy in the same scripture several times in the, in the word because they're not the same thing. Um, so that's that's a very important thing to, to understand. We are empowered by the spirit of God. In fact, without the spirit of God, we can't. And that's what Paul's trying to explain. In the flesh, we cannot please God, but praise the Lord. We are not in the flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Because the curse of the law doesn't apply to us, and we're, we have the power to walk righteously. Praise Him for that. Amen. You know, speaking of the Spirit, you know, we don't we don't think enough about the verses that prophesied what the Spirit, what why He would give us His Spirit. So I want to share Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36. Uh, verses 19 through 21, and I will give them one heart and I'll put a new spirit within you and I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them an heart of flesh for what? That they may walk in my statues and keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for them whose heart walketh after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their way upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 36 essentially says the exact same thing. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness. Hallelujah. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit will I put with, within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You know, so... <sighs> That's why I, ha you know, again, you'll get the you'll get the comment that says, you know, I've got the spirit to just guide me to to just know, you know, when I'll sin or not sin. But 
I think it's pretty clear, you know, from the, from these two passages in Ezekiel that why he gives us a spirit. So I must ask if someone is being led away from the commands, you know, is that the spirit that's leading them away from the commands? You know, I, I can't, I can't imagine that it would be. Um, but, um, any case, I just, I want to just add that real quick while we're talking about the spirit. Well, yeah, you know, scripture tells us we're to test the spirits to see whether they be of God. So this is what blows my mind is some of the people who are coming against us are saying that we're spitting on the blood of Christ and we don't have the Holy Spirit because we're relying on the law. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> I mean, where does the Holy Spirit ever drive people away from obedience to God? Wh where? Like you're trying to say that I don't have the spirit because I'm trying to walk in God's ways. That doesn't make any sense at all. The, the job of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all tr all truth and mm -hmm. to walk, quote, in the Spirit. I mean, hello. I mean, we actually have to explain this to people. When I was in the ministry, uh, I was in an international missions organization, and th they were their <coughs> excuse me, their uh, mission statement was um, uh, empowering people to start uh, grace oriented churches. You know. Um, I forget the whole exact wording, but it was basically grace was the big thing. That was the big buzzword. So I was a multimedia director for the ministry. So I would travel to these various foreign countries and get entrenched with the missionaries and do what they do and help them, but also document it. And since that was the mission, I would often ask the nationals, um, what does grace mean to you? And most of most people would give us the the usual unmerited favor. Uh, you know, typical definition of grace. <clears throat> but this one guy in Kazakhstan, he said, no, grace to me is the empowering presence of God that enables me to be who I'm called to be and to do what I'm called to do. Oh, I, was, I was like, wow, dude. It, and it includes unmerited favor. It includes all of that. But when you apply his definition to grace, because uh, when you, when I typically think of the word, when I hear the word grace, I think like, the Google answer you got, I think of a ballerina, you know, she's graceful, you know, it's just kind of this, this feminine feeling, you know, of just grace, soft mm. grace, you know, yes, it is that it has that certainly, but that guy in Kazakhstan gave me a much more powerful understanding of grace, the empowering presence of God that enables me to be who I'm called to be and to do what I'm called to do in any situation. That's why Paul, who's getting anything but unmerited favor, you know, he's getting beaten up everywhere he goes, and mm -hmm. he's crying out. And th by the way, the thorn in the flesh that he's talking about, that's actually a Hebrew idiom. If you go back to the Torah, not, and I forget what chapter it is in the book of Numbers, it's an idiom that means persecution. So mm -hmm. Paul is using a well-known Hebrew idiom for his... I mean, if you read... If you read that passage where he talks about the thorn in his flesh, read the previous chapters. Mm -hmm. He's like, you want to know what I've been through? I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been whipped. I've been left for dead. I've been stoned. You know, he gives this long list of what he's gone through. Pretend the big number is not there because the Bible wasn't written in chapter and verse. Just keep reading, you know, mm -hmm. with one consistent thought. And I prayed three times that he would take away this thorn in the flesh. This messenger, a person, an individual of Satan, sent to buffet me. And if you look up the Greek word for buffet, it means punch in the face. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, okay. It, God's answer was, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not thinking ballerinas here. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know, the, if you look at what he's going through and you apply the definition the guy in Kazakhstan gave, well, all of a sudden that story makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been beat up everywhere I go. I've been left for dead, shipwrecked, all this stuff. God, can you take this persecution away from me? No, Paul, my empowering presence is going to enable you to go through this so you could be the man that I called you to be when I knocked you off the horse. Mm -hmm. And do the things that I've commissioned you to do. Amen. Well, Amen. Then all of a sudden, grace makes a whole lot more sense as a power tool mm -hmm. instead of just a ballerina. Yeah. And what another good example? That's um, that's an awesome one. But another one is uh, I need to have to find the scripture again. But in uh, Yeshua's early life, it says that when he was growing up, it says that and yeah. great grace was upon him. Now, if grace was only a matter of forgiveness of sin, of mercy for sin, that would make literally no sense. That's a really good point. Yeshua would not need grace. Absolutely. But 
a man empowered perfectly by the Spirit of God has great grace. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so. and that was that was that passage also was huge for me in in crossing over to a new understanding. It's like, what does the Son of God need unmerited favor, you know, for yeah. I mean, you know from from the Father? I mean, he's God. He's perfect. He's sinless. But it said he grew in grace. Mm -hmm. He grew in the empowering presence of his father to do what he was called to do and to be who he's called to be to the point of going willingly to the cross. Mm -hmm. Like that, that just, if you, man, I mean, I, I've done, I've written, directed and played Jesus and passion plays studying up on, you know, crucifixion and stuff like that. There's, there's no more horrific way to die than that. Mm. You want to talk about needing the empowering presence of God to enable you to willingly go there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's yeah. really, it's really amazing. It must have been grace that even kept him conscious long enough to endure all of the, the stuff he endured It's just so crazy. You can't, you can't help, you know, but just imagine what that felt like, you know, it was it's, it's Psalm 22, isn't it? Where he talks about how, you know, his, his tongue was sticking to the roof of his mouth and, um, just, I can just only imagine did, I, I read a write up on that before Rob, and, and maybe you're referencing the same thing, but, but how the body reacts, uh, when one is crucified, how like the lungs fill up or, or something like that. Is that right? Yeah. I, I think. Yeah. He actually literally died of a, of a truly broken heart, like mm. not just grieved in his heart, which he certainly was his heart exploded basically. I mean, he, wow. he you know, it just. It is horrible. I, I mean, when you think about, and I've tried to illustrate this when I was teaching Sunday school, is have the have the teenagers stand up on their tippy toes, on on one foot, and like cross their other foot over it and bend their legs and just stay there with just freestanding, just stand there with your legs bent, and it doesn't take very long for the Charlie horses to start kicking in. Well, imagine that on top of the fact that all of your weight is hanging on spikes that are going through your feet. So you have the mm -hmm. spike that's already painful enough going through your feet. Your whole body's weight is on that spike and your legs are bent and you're having to support your body like that to breathe. Uh, and every breath you take, every single breath you take is a new symphony of pain throughout your entire body. I mean, whew, that's just... For him to willingly do that, oh, man, what a savior. Praise Yeshua. Can we all just say that? And can we all just agree? I mean, so let's let's be on record. Are we are we saved by by faith or by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, Yeshua? Can we all admit admit that right now here? In, and not of record? works, lest any man should boast. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Be screwed otherwise. <laughs> you, know, well, you know, people think that we're talking about this, and they always add that for salvation. I right. don't know anybody. I know you guys don't. I don't mm -hmm. personally know anybody who is who is walking in the commandments of God that are doing it for salvation, to be saved. None of us are doing that. We get accused of that every All day, time. a few every hundred day. times on Facebook, no matter how many times you say it. It's supposed to be a fruit, a manifestation of, that you have his spirit in you. And 1 John 2 calls it out, man. I mean, 1 John 2 says, if any man says that we are in him and doesn't keep his commandments, then he is a liar and the oh. truth is not in him. Mm -hmm. And when I look at Facebook, there's a whole lot of people that by John's definition, not Rob Skiba, John's definition are liars that don't have the truth in them. And that right. should, Matthew 7 should scare the snot out of you. If you read Matthew 7, he says many Focus on that word, many. What's many. the definition of many? Isn't it the most? Man, many. Yeah. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, and many of these people are also against using the names of God. You know, some say Yahweh, I use Yahuwah. Some say Jehovah. They, you know, we have, we're trying to say the name of God with four consonants. Okay. Four consonants. Uh, or Yeshua. So they'll mock us for trying to use the actual names that are in Scripture. And there will be all the ones about Lord. 
Lord, Lord, Lord. You know, King James says, Lord, Lord, Lord. So it says, many will come to me in those days and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy? Well, one of my big detractors out there is all big about prophecy. He's kept in prophecy. He has a word, rhema word all the time, kept in prophecy, right? Didn't we cast out demons? Oh, yeah, you know, they cast out demons at conferences and stuff. Didn't we do many mighty works? Oh, he'll brag about all the mighty works. These are all the descriptions that Jesus says, Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 7. Lord, Lord, prophecy, casting out demons, mighty works. Uh, did we do all this in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you that work iniquity. And iniquity is lawlessness when you right. look that word up. No, yeah, up. right. Like you said earlier, nomia. You know, it's what's interesting, uh, and I think you just said it. First uh, John two really explains to us, you know, what how we know him. I, I don't think there's any other scripture that tells us, you know, this is how you know. He says, "I never knew you." Well, that's a really really scary. Um, and so this is the easiest one to, to, to decipher that. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It's pretty simple. And, you know, uh, I've shared this before with the stream, uh, that very also famous verse in Romans 8, uh, th there is therefore no condemnation that, that, that for, I'm sorry, for they who are in Christ Jesus. Um, it, it's right here as well. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Uh, but whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfective. And here we go. Hereby know we that we are in him. So it's like another like kind of a key. But go, sticking going back to Matthew well, seven, wait, like you read, read the next verse, verse right? Six. Oh yeah, it's it, exactly. You know, you say you know we follow Jesus. Oh, well, hey, awesome. This is this is it right here. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. How did he, how did Yeshua walk? He walked obedient to the father as any, are any of us going to be perfect? No. And so, you know, as we get asked all the time, you know, do we keep the 613 laws perfectly? Well, of course not. Ne not even Yeshua did himself because out of those 613 laws, some are for farmers only, some are for Levites only, some are for women only, some are for men only, and you know, so on and so forth. So none of us can keep it perfectly, but that's not the point. But going back to, to Matthew 7, because it's a really, really interesting verse, not interesting, but it could be a very scary verse for some people. Well, here's a, a parallel verse, uh, in my opinion, in 2 Ezra 15. For those of you that haven't been on this channel for some time, uh, I've gone through 2 Ezra in great, day, in great depth, in great length to show that it is inspired. But not only that, uh, keep in mind, this was included in the 1611 King James uh, and also the founding the founding fathers of this country that came over, the, the pilgrims that were you know seeking uh, religious uh, asylum. You know, they came over with the 1520 and 1599 Geneva Bibles, all included Second Ezra. So listen to this. Uh, this is Second Ezra 15. Woe to those who sin and do not observe my commandments, says the Lord. I will not spare them. Here's the, here's the same scene. Depart, you faithless children. Do not pollute my sanctuary, for the Lord knows all who transgress against him. Therefore, he will hand them over to death and slaughter. For now calamities have come upon the whole earth, and you shall remain in them. For God will not deliver you because you have sinned against him. It's the very same scene that we saw in Matthew 7. Wow. Second Ezra 15, is that what it yeah. was? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Which, uh, wow. if you guys didn't know, uh, Yeshua himself did quote from Second Ezra. So I think it's in Matthew twenty-two or Matthew twenty-three that um, that scene where Yeshua said, um, oh, "Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stones the prophets and kill them that are sent unto thee." How often I would gather th gather thee as uh, hens gather their chicks under the wings, and you would not. That's actually from he quoted directly from Second Ezra. So a very very important book for these uh, for these last days. Second Ezra. It's uh, as you guys know, it's been a very big focal point of this ministry. But, wow. yeah, it's the very same scene. Well, you know, that's the other thing is, you know, some of these guys that have been coming after me, they're all about the two commandments. Jesus said, like, oh, we only have two commandments. Well, but the two commandments are love God and love your neighbor, which just are those two summarize the 10. The 613 elaborate on the 10. So, it, it, you're, first of all, you're not loving your brother when you're going psycho and calling him a heretic and labeling him and, and making hit pieces every five minutes. That's that's not loving your brother. Secondly, how does Scripture define loving God? You know, Jesus isn't speaking out in a void. He he has a precedence for what he says, and he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy more than any other book. So go there, and you'll see over and over and over and over again what loving God means consistently. It's talked about loving God is keeping his commandments, walking in his statutes and ordinances and doing what he says to do. That's his love language. If we want to you know, think of it that way, 
And that's what First John 5, 1 through 3 says point blank. In case you're confused, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That's kindergarten level English, guys. I mean, how, how much more plain could it possibly be? So if you say, yes, we've got to love God and love our neighbor, well, loving God means doing what he says, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not arguing and calling people heretics for doing so. Right. Which is not loving your brother. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, well, speaking of which, uh, Deuteronomy 6, you know, I, I, another thing we get accused of quite often is focusing too much on the law. Well, you know, again, it's hard to understand the New Testament if you don't understand what it was founded upon. Uh, if you guys don't mind, I'm just going to read a little bit of Deuteronomy 6. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days might be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers had promised thee, in a land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So I think he wants us to focus on his law. This has always been what what he wanted from us. And here we we've taught we've said this before, but I know we've all, we're always getting new uh, brothers and sisters joining us. But you know we talk a lot about you know don't take the mark of the beast, don't take the mark of the beast. You know the mark of the beast very well may be a microchip or, or something physical. I, I don't know, but it is also really interesting that. The, the commands, the, the law of our Heavenly Father, what does he say? He says, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is either in the right hand or in the forehead. Well, guess what? Frontlets between thine eyes is your forehead. So really interesting. And thou shalt wow. write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. So I think our Heavenly Father, not I think, Scripture tells us that our Heavenly Father does want us to dwell on His law and, and to focus on it. Um, these are His ways. And, you know, obviously we can get to here in, in a little bit, but there's so much prophecy, that, and, and there's so much prophecy that tells us we will be walking Torah, we'll be celebrating the feast dates in the future, in the millennial reign, if we make it through the door, you know? Why? What makes us think that there's like a pause button on the feasts and the Sabbath and, and the commands in between, you know, uh, when Yeshua died and and when we're uh, when we're brought back into the land and uh, taken into New Jerusalem? It just it's it's mind boggling. And I, I feel bad. And, you know, that's why I want to have talks like these so that hopefully someone out there that maybe hasn't looked into these things that maybe was following someone that says, oh, yeah, forsake the Torah, which even if you don't agree with Torah, I, I don't know how a believer that believes in the same in the same book and the same scriptures as truth, how you can speak so ill of something the father commanded, you know, usually we'll get mocked and ridiculed. Again, the first, the first thing is usually, Oh, do you follow all 613 commands? Are you stoning your children? Are you stoning, you know, blasphemers? Are you, do, you know? And so it's like, it's such a mocking way. I just don't understand how someone that confesses Jesus Christ, Yahusha HaMashiach could honestly just blaspheme the eternal law of the most high that we, if you believe that you're going to be resurrected or, or raptured or, or whatever it is and, and, and brought to Yeshua who walked the Torah perfectly, how you could possibly, how that could come out. But we know, we know by Yeshua's teaching that out of the abundance of the heart, so the mouth speaketh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, and that's actually a very, um, a very interesting verse uh, out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaketh because, you know, you know, I, I think something that needs to be said that no one wants to say, and I'm going to try and be uh, graceful here is what I've come to, to find is think about this rationally. If, if doing something for, for the father, because he asked us to do it, was really easy to do, uh, which, by the way, if if you actually do die to self, Torah is very easy to do. Um, but let's let's assume that it's easier than that. Let's say the Bible just says, 
a once a week um, eat a sandwich. And let's just say that there's some argument over whether or not you technically have to eat a sandwich. It's like a, it's like the baptismal argument. People have this argument. Well, are you technically saved or not saved before after baptism? That's a huge, huge thing, right? Um, but most people will agree. Well, either way, like you should just do it because we were told to do it, and that's obedience. And you know, why why even play with play with that? You know, if it's something simple and easy to do, no one has a problem with doing it. It's it's when a a a law or a request or not a request or a commandment is what it is of the most high comes into conflict with a stronghold in your personal walk in your personal life that suddenly um we seek naturally it's it's just a, a natural reaction i think for people um to try and justify um the their inability to actually do what it says to do because it relieves their re the requirement altogether. If you if you believe you can't do it, or you're told if if, you, if you're told you can't do it, or uh, you know something to that effect, then it relieves you from the responsibility of actually doing it. When the reality of it is, his laws are not burdensome, and they are good and holy and righteous, as Paul said. Um, and these are all things that we can do. Um, it's really just a matter of whether or not you're willing to do it. And you know it's it's interesting. It, it ties into another thing. My um, my wife often gets a question about uh, uh, head coverings and head wraps because uh, she wears she wears one, and a lot of a lot of her friends wear them as well. Um, they they don't you know uh, they never push that on anyone. Um, they never really even teach about it. They just get questions about it a lot. They see other women see them wearing it, and they're like, hey, what's with the thing? Why do you? Why are you wearing it? Do I have to wear that? Do you are you saying that I have to put that on my head? And and that's kind of like the way they respond, just because they see her doing it. They want to know what does she think about them? Is she judging them? And of course, she's not judging them at all. She could, you know, really care less if they decide to wear a head covering or not. Um, but one of the interesting uh, bits of wisdom that I think has come from that is one of the things that sh she often tells people is if it's if it's something that you're not willing to do uh, simply because if you don't want to um, look bad or because you don't want to uh, look like you're submitting to something, then there's probably a good reason for you to actually do it then. Because the, what we're trying to do is remove those strongholds in our life, these fleshly attachments we have to this world, whatever they are, whether it be uh, vanity, um, pride, um, or, or some sort of, you know, just, just habit that you're dealing with or struggles in life with friends and family or your schedule or whatever it might, might be. Um, instead of, instead of trying to seek to justify those actions, um, I think what the spirit of God really calls us to do is instead die to self and rearrange our priorities and, um, and it's not always easy, but that's why um, we're told over and over again that dying to self is so immensely important. I mean, I, I believe that Jesus, Yeshua, told the rich young ruler to sell everything and follow him because Yeshua knew that that was specifically what that young man uh, was attached to. Um, so if you take that one parable out of context and say everyone needs to sell everything, then you totally miss the point. If that young man was struggling with something, some other egregious um, issue, uh, whether it be pride or whatever, then I believe Yeshua would have told him to do something else because he was trying to justify himself by the law only. He said, yeah, I kept all the commandments. I did all those things. But Yeshua looked into his heart and said, yeah, but you're not really willing to give it all up for me. And I can prove that to you right now. Sell everything and follow me. And he couldn't do it. He walked away sad, it says. And... I think when the, when the Most High and the Spirit of God shows us something that we don't want to let go of, that it's actually a blessing. That's an opportunity for us to let go, to just let go, trust in Him, and have faith. And this is what faith really is about. Have faith that His way of doing things, despite all your urges to contradict it, 
is going to be beneficial, is the right way, is a blessed way, and will lead to, uh, you know, just the sanctification of of our souls. You know, so out of the out of the uh, you know heart the mouth speaks, I think is accurate, uh, Adam, because I think in many cases what we're seeing is people lashing out against something, whether it be the whole law or one specific one because they personally are having an issue with it in their own life. And that, that is not, if, if you want to take that snippet there and, and run with it and say, Oh, this Pharisee's all judging us now and saying that, you know, he's good, He's perfect. And I'm not, and he's, you know, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I have to die to self daily too. You know, I find things in my walk that I'm still holding on to and he has to rebuke me and tell me to let them go. So I'm not by no means saying I'm perfect, but when we come up against that conflict, God's will or our will, what are you going to do? That's the question. And that's the question. When you answer that question, you can see why God said, or the scriptures say that Noah and Abraham, it says that they were perfect. Perfect. What that means is when they're, will contradicted god's will they yielded to his and that made them perfect and that's and that's what that's what the context really means there and so i really think that's what we have is, is just an age-old spiritual warfare clash of wills um the, the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the spirit and all, all we're asking people to do is um, don't condemn people who are being led of the spirit to be obedient in one way or another and, and it's our accusing them, especially falsely accusing us, which is what we get. Of, we get that a lot. I get falsely accused. Like people say, I said things I, I just simply didn't say. They say things happened that never happened. Um, what? Don't do that. Don't do that. Come on. Why are you doing that? This is not about me and attacking me and killing me. Even will not will not rescue you from from the truth that is God's word and the responsibilities we have to die to self and yield to Him. And that's. All I wanted to say about that. Fantastically said. <laughs> Very well said. You know, it makes you wonder, like, uh, I mean, what is it that these people are so angry about? I mean, all you have to do is suggest that, you know, as believers, we probably should obey God and they will go crazy on you. And it's like, wh why? Why? Like, you know, I said that something, I put a meme out the other day. I was like, you know, if something's on your heart, it should compel you to do it. You, you know, if we say we have Jesus in our heart or the law has been written on my heart or the Holy Spirit's in my heart or whatever, well, then you should be compelled to want to walk that way. As first John two says, you know, are we all perfect? No, that's first John two, one, first John two, one. He says, I'm writing these things to you, little children, that you do not sin. Sin is Defined first in the next chapter, transgress the law. So I'm writing these things to you that you do not transgress, transgress the law. But if you do, you have an advocate, Christ Jesus the righteous, right? Okay, great. Woo That's awesome. So I don't have to beat myself up. It's like many times people who get into this walk, they will pendulum swing and they'll find themselves pretty quickly getting into legalism and judging others while well, your tassels aren't long enough or your gut, you don't have this, or you didn't like the candle or you didn't whatever. And people do this pendulum swing into frankly, rabbinic Judaism. And that's not right either. You know, uh, there's a, there's a balance there. And um, Dr. Russ Hauck wrote a book called uh, epidemic examining the infected roots of Judaism and Christianity. And I could summarize the whole thing by a picture that he drew in there. It's a real, kind of rough, uh, you know, stick person type of looking drawing, but it's like a, a hill with a road going out to like a sunset. And on either side of the hill are uh, ditches, two ditches, the ditch of pagan Christianity, which most of us were raised in Christmas and Easter and all that stuff. And Sunday replacing Sabbath. And we come up onto the straight and narrow path. We realize, Hey, Torah means instructions and he's got instructions for us and they're all for our benefit. That's all good. Yay. And then out, out of your zeal, to try to walk in those ways, some people do the same thing that the Pharisees did. They'll create all kinds of uh, fences to make sure we, well, you know, what does it mean to rest on the Sabbath? I mean, we can't, you got to put one shoe on this way, the other shoe on that way. And you you basically end up, all you can do is lay in bed and breathe shallow because otherwise you're going to violate something, right? And that's what Yeshua was rebuking these people for what they had done. God, he's like, 
that's not what my dad meant. You know, the Sabbath is chill out, dude. Just stop working. You know, it doesn't have to be what you're making it out to be. But so people slide out. They go up into the onto the straight and narrow path, and then they slide off into the other ditch of rabbinic Judaism. And then you have people who are raised in rabbinic Judaism finding their Messiah, realizing who he is, and then before long they're sliding into pagan Christianity and they're no longer doing Sabbath. They're on Sunday now. They got, you know, Christmas trees up in their practice and, you know, they don't do the feasts anymore. And, you know, wow, you know, it's all been done away with. And his book is designed to try to put up the guardrails on the straight and narrow path. So whichever side you came up on, you can get on the straight and narrow path and stay there. So once you're there and you're walking on the straight and narrow path and you realize everything that Yahuwah has done for us, all of the amazing things, I have to literally, and I've made a practice of thanking God before I finally fall asleep. The last thing I do is God, thank you for so many things that he has done in my life. And the more you get to know him, the more you want to obey him. Amen. You just because you know how much he loves you. I mean, every one of his, if you want to say 613, fine. Every one of his laws are there for our benefit. You know, most of those are Levitical and they deal with the priest when there's a temple and it has to do with worshiping God in that system. I get that. But the other ones are that outside of that system are there, you know, put a fence around the roof of your, your house so your neighbor doesn't fall off when he comes to visit you. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just common sense stuff to, you know, don't have sex with sheep. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's bad. You know, but what is it that you are opposed to guys? Why would we say we should keep the commandments of God and, and their knee jerk response is to rebel against that rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, by the way. Um, you have to ask, why are you getting so upset with the idea of obeying God? God, like, do we really have to ask this question of people who say they're Bible-believing Christians? Well, unfortunately, yes, we do. And Paul said it is the carnal mind that is at war with God. And so there you go. Right. And, you know, speaking of Paul <clears throat> in, in obedience, you know, we read in uh, chapter 12 of Romans that, you know, we're to offer up ourselves as a living sacrifice, and it's our, our reasonable service, you know? And, and, we were talking about this before. I think most Christians agree that the Ten Commandments are good, but most have a problem with the Fourth Commandment because it infringes upon our, you know, routine sometimes, and you have to make some adjustments. But, you know, I, I think, oh, I know, I, I know, Justin, his his how his family has been blessed um, since they started uh, celebrating the Sabbath, and same with mine, and it's been just a blessing. And that's what we're coming to find is that the law is a is a blessing, and it's not. It's not bad. And like Yeshua says, he's, you know, my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that comes from Deuteronomy 30, which, you know, basically says, hey, the law isn't, you know, across the ocean. It's not or it's not in the mm -hmm. bottom of the ocean. It's not someone doesn't have to go up in heaven and get it for you. No, it's right there. It's right. It's in you for you to do it. And and I think we've all come to see that. And speaking of what Yeshua said, let me just read a couple, uh, couple of verses from the mouth of our Savior. And I think, honestly, dispensationalism is is the biggest crock that has come to the faith. Uh, it really is. And just to, just to um, give Justin a shout out real quick, Rob, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier the uh, identity crisis. Justin, Justin was able to take, I think that what two or three hour version of what Jim Staley did and turn it into like a 39 minute video. It's called the, uh, the identity crisis, finding the lost sheep. You should check it out one time. Awesome. Awesome way of condensing everything. But you know, another, another video he did was, you know, talking about the dispensationalism, what happened in the late 1800s, especially with this country. And the biggest thing, the biggest thing about dispensationalism that really gets me is, you know, we talk so much about how we're saved by Yeshua, but dispensationalism tells us that, you know, we don't even listen to him because anything prior to the cross is Old Testament still and doesn't apply to the church. And it's just, it's so much, it's so much confusion and nonsense, but, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's take a look at what Yeshua said himself. Uh, let me, uh, oop. while you do that, can you tell me where that video is? I'd love to see that, uh, condensed version. Can, right. can you send me a link just in yeah. the chat? Yeah. It's, uh, I'll pull it up real quick. You know, I want to just tell you real quick, um, since we're on the topic, I, uh, I didn't even know who Jim Staley was actually. Um, and I felt led to 
to um, study this and create a video out of it, out of what I had found in my, my personal studies. Now, I was influenced by uh, the Lost Sheep video from 119 Ministries and uh, a couple other studies that I found. But I, I honestly didn't know who Jim Stilley was or I didn't know that he made a teaching called The Identity Crisis actually until the day that I posted this video and someone commented, hey, if you're going to use the title The Identity Crisis, you should at least give Jim Staley credit. And I said, oh, who's Jim Staley? So I looked it up and my, my heart just dropped into my stomach when I found out that he literally taught the exact same thing and named it the exact same thing. And his was four, four times longer and four times better. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> man, I, I, if I'd have known that, I would have just, you know, like shared that on my channel instead. I just posted it in the, uh, the comments section. Well, it's good because, Justin, you know, this generation has such a short attention span that, you know, uh, the 39, 40 minute video is much more likely going to be watched than, than trying to say, so, to, trying to share it and say, hey, watch this, you know, four hour video. You know, people just aren't going to do it. But for whatever reason, I can't screen share anymore. But, you know, I see this getting twisted all the time. And there's a brother that I'm, I'm chatting with uh, back and forth, and I love him so much. But, He's really twisting Yeshua's words here. Matthew 5, 17 through 19, we've we've all seen it, but I mean, we really have to take his words at face value. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till when? Till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle shall no wise pass in the law from, till all be fulfilled. Here's the next part. And Paul says the same, almost the exact same thing in, in 2 Timothy. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I don't know. Is it wrong to strive to be, to, to not to not want to be least and would rather be greatest? I, I don't know. But, you know, we have to really take his words for what they say. And the other thing, we also hear that, you know, Yeshua had, had rebuked the, the Pharisees. And a lot of people will think that what Yeshua was rebuking him for was following the law. It's not true. It was obviously the oral tradition of what you were mentioning earlier, uh, Rob, was the you know the Talmud and the, the, the oral law. But Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. But you got to keep reading because they'll think they'll say, hey, see, look, he doesn't care about that. He just, he wants, you know, uh, judgment, mercy, faith. But then he says, these you ought to have done and what, and not leave the other undone, you know? So it is important. And it's just like what, what James says, faith without works, it's dead being alone. Um, but in any case, I just wanted to, uh, just share yeah. that. I think, uh, it, it's a good, um, that's another good thing I wanted to point out actually, because it reminds me of, of the flat earth topic because, you know, when I, when I, um, and ironically, um, you know, obviously Rob, Rob, you have a, a, a huge part in that. Um, when I first found out, when I first had the personal, I made the personal decision to believe that based on all the study I had done, which was originally, I did all the study on just the, the scientific so-called first, the, uh, you know, the atmospherics and the orbital mechanics and all that. I did that. That's how I was convinced and then I, I stumbled across this video called uh, Flat Earth Conference Amsterdam by a guy named Rob Skiba. And I watched that thing and I was just like, the Bible is also the best Flat Earth book that exists. I didn't know that. Like now that now I'm like completely 1000% sold and I'm even more in love with this than ever. And that was, that was probably like about two years ago or maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. Anyway, um, so... The, the point, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the first thing I did in my own excitement was what many people do. I ran to my friends and family thinking they would be just as excited and happy about this as I was. And I was, I was like a naive, you know, I was like a lost, what's it called? A lost baby squirrel in a forest fire. I was just like, like I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I was like, Hey guys, great news. <laughs> I just found out the coolest thing ever. And I shared this. <laughs> That the Bible says this, and all my study had pointed me towards this, and I had no idea. I had no clue what was going to come next. I didn't know fire and brimstone would rain from people, and it would just be a terror, and I would lose friends and family, and everyone was going to freak out on me. And so then you put in this position where you're doing like, you know, like flat Earth apologetics. So you're like, wait, 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 wait. Why are you? First of all, why are you mad at me? You know. Second of all, 
I'm not stupid. Why are you calling me stupid? Let me just show you what I saw, you know? And that's kind of how you approach it. You're like, and, and I think most people start off that way. You're like, well, hey, first of all, like you don't buy me mad. Second of all, you don't gotta call me an idiot, okay? I, I like, I, I'm not, I, I did, I, I got good grades in my master's degree, if that means anything. It just means I was more indoctrinated than most people really, to be honest with you. But I'm not retarded, like, and sorry for using that word, but you know, I don't know why you're telling me that I am all this. You, a minute ago, you were talking to me like you thought I was like a great guy and you really respected my opinion. And you you were just telling you know people that I was a, a good friend and, and, and wise beyond my years, you were saying these things. And now I tell you that I'm using that credibility now to, to say, check this out. And you're, and now you're saying I'm an idiot. Now you're saying I'm a second grader. So that reaction, I had, I had the same uh, thing happen with Torah because when I came into YouTube, uh, into the ministry, I was not, I was not Torah observant. I didn't call myself Torah observant. Um, but I was desperately hungry, on fire, consuming this every day, trying to understand as much as I can. And the question came up, like, what is, what is sin? What does it mean to, what is the law that, that Paul's talking about? What is the law that Yeshua is talking about? I really need to understand that because that's really important that I make sure I don't mess that, mess that up because I really want to please him. I love him so much and I'm just on fire for the Lord. So I start digging into this. What is this? What does this mean? And when I when I found out what it meant, I was so happy, so excited, so like overjoyed, and I couldn't wait to just to just adapt the culture and just to do the tour portions. And I was just so excited about it. And we have so much fun with our Sabbath and, and with the feasts. And it's, I'm like, man, I, I have a family that I didn't know I had. I have a community I didn't know I had. I'm so excited about this. And the same thing as what happened with the FE conversation happened. I, I came with this with this joy, like, hey, guys, I found out something that just changed my life. And I'm so excited to share it. And I, it, the, <laughs> I got the same reaction, you know, just... I, I was shocked at how angry people became. And now it's like you go from wanting to share something that brought you joy, which is what the point I'm making is. You just, we wanna share something that's bringing you peace and joy and shalom and blessing. And you just wanna share that with people and you wanna help them understand what, what the word is really saying about these things because you love them and you love him. And then next thing you know, you're backed into this corner where you're an idiot, you're a heretic, and you're you're doing Torah apologetics with Rob Skiba on a Friday night, you know. <laughs> and you're like, that's not what it, I never intended it for it to be this way. I just I just love his ways, and I wanted to share it. And now I'm made out to be everyone's enemy, you know. And so, um, should we it, really be all that surprised? I mean, it it is written, isn't it? Well, and now I'm seeing that too, you know, it is written and it's in the prophecy and it's, it's all part of God's plan. I know, and I trust that plan. Um, but I just, I just wanted to show that perspective that this, this, this originally was about, was about joy. This was, was originally about, about excitement and revelation and peace and just, man, it's so awesome. Like, this is so great. This is so great. We are well, yeah, that's the point right there is so many people that have embraced what we're talking about here. They'll all say the same thing. I don't know anybody is like, oh, woe is me. This is a horrible burden that I'm taking on myself. Oh, this is terrible. I have to stop working and rest with my friends and family and hang out with God. <laughs> it's terrible. Like in the feasts, right? I mean, all of the feasts, One, if you actually understand what they're about and how much they – really tell us about our messiah i mean once you do a real passover with the understanding of yeshua forget easter man <laughs> just forget all of that and once you get into the fall season when you get you know day of atonement yes that's a that's a sobering time that's a that's a get serious get right with god moment right there right but feast of trumpets you know on either side of atonement you got feast of trumpets and tabernacles where Tabernacles actually tells you to use your tithe money ooh, to <laughs> save up and like bring strong drink and have fun. Like there's actually a I was here. blown away the first time I read that. I'm like, what? Did, you know, I, like, what? Did it just say that? 
it, there's actually a command to have fun. Ooh, that's so horrible. This is terrible. The burden. Oh. <laughs> like everybody I know that is truly loving God the way he said to love them. The only thing I've heard from every one of them is how awesome this is. Mm -hmm. this is I don't know anybody that feels like they're in shackles and bondage. It's only those who are ridiculing us that are claiming that it's that terrible. You know? They're the one, I think they're the ones in bondage. They're the ones in bondage. They have this this just disdain and hate. Let's let's share some scriptures of what what the word actually says about the law. Let's just let's do that real quick. My screen share is working in Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Listen, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Talking about bondage or, or, or freedom, Psalm 119, 44 through 45, So shall I keep thy law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. And one last one. James 1.25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Hallelujah. So the law is a great thing. And we're, we're learning that. We really are. I'm, I'm learning as I go. And it's been a blessing. If nothing else, I think, I think celebrating Shabbat has been just I mean, just walk changing uh, as far as, you know, taking that time, st studying scriptures on the, on the Sabbath, having that just full day of rest. And it's like, what are we actually fighting here? And I know, I know there's brothers and sisters that have work schedules that uh, they haven't been able to clear up yet. You know, Saturdays, they just can't do it. I get it. I totally get it. The only thing I'd say to that is, again, if you, if you want to strive to be able to do this, I would just say, just pray and, and is our heavenly father, you know, can he not make a change, give you a better job or, 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 you know, put it within your boss's mind to, you know, to, um, fulfill your request to have Saturdays off or, you know, whatnot. So just keep that in mind, but it has been such a blessing to do so. And, and am I right here? Am I, am I walking perfectly in Torah and the commandments? No, you know, and, and like, like Rob said earlier, that's where first John two verses one through two, he's like, don't sin. You know, but if you do, you have an advocate, you know, but at the same time, are we just to trample that? I think uh, what Hebrews 10 has quite a bit to say for those that continue in willful sin, and it is not a good thing, you know. Did I just freeze? You guys still here? No, we're still here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> My, I think I thought I froze for a second, but... I heard We're all in deep thought. I, like, I heard crickets. So I was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like reading comments and oh uh, yeah, yeah. I try not to because if I start doing it, I get lost and I don't even I can't even pay attention to the conversation. I know. <laughs> yeah, I saw somebody freaking out about using tithe to to get alcohol. So I was look actually looking that up. Oh yeah, it's there. I it's it's funny you said that because I read it the other day or well, a couple months ago, and I was just like, Florida. You know, I I can't remember how many times I read that, but I just never clicked that that's what he was actually saying is to take that tithe money and to go spend it on your heart's desire. He's like, if you want to do strong, if you want strong drink, get strong drink. You know, it's like, whoa, really? Did he just say that? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, well, I was, I was trying to think earlier, where was it that? Uh, I think it's uh Deuteronomy. I think I found it. Deuteronomy 14. Um, I'm just trying to see if Deuteronomy 14 is in the, in the context of, uh, Sukkot. Um, yeah, go ahead. What you're saying, I'll, I'll just read through it and see if that's the one I'm talking about. I um, no, I was look. I was trying to think. Is it Zechariah 14 that talks about you know the, those nations that don't celebrate um, uh, Sukkot? It, it is Zechariah. I don't know if it's 14, but it's it's somewhere in there because uh, Sukkot. We will be doing Sukkot in the right. millennial reign. Right. Well, I'm looking here. Uh, I'll just I'll just kind of share this uh, while I've got it up here. Isaiah 66 at the end of it. This is a uh, this is this is prophecy. This is after the 
Yeah, right here. So for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship me, saith the Lord. So, I mean, right here, you know, Sabbath is going to be celebrated in the new heaven and new earth. What well, makes us think that it's not a vi that it's not in in play right now? That it's not, you know, part of our walk right now. Well, yeah, I mean, when you look at the Leviticus twenty three and other complementary texts in the Torah talking about the uh, the Moedim, the appointed times, he consistently uses words like forever, everlasting, perpetual in all so, your generations, yeah, throughout your generations. Right, right. There's never an indication that this is going to go to until I send my son and then it's going to stop at the cross. And then you're going to throw all that away and create something new called the Lord's Supper and you know, celebrate his birthday on Mithra's birthday and uh, Ishtar Day. There's none of that. It's, it's all it's yeah, it's all there. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and read this um, Deuteronomy what is it, 14 talking about tithes. Uh, there's talk about clean and unclean food. Deuteronomy 14, and this, what is this, ESV, I guess, uh, beginning in verse 22. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field year by year, and before Yahuwah your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, you shall eat the tithe of your grain. Eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, and of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear Yahuwah your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, when Yahuwah your God blesses you because the place is too far from you, which Yahuwah your God chooses to set his name there, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place that Yahuwah your God chooses and spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep or wine or strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, and you shall eat there before Yahuwah your God and rejoice, wow. you and your household. You shall rejoice. There's a horrible <laughs> commandment right there. <laughs> And you shall not neglect the Levite who is within your towns, for he has no portion or inheritance with you. In other words, you're supposed to invite him in, have fun with you. At the end of every three years, you shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in the year, in the same year, and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns, you shall come and eat and be filled that you, who your God may bless you in all your work. Oh, that's horrible. Ah. The, I don't know these legalists bondage that's such bondage the lord your god may bless you in all your work in your hands that you do wow that's just horrible wow thanks for i'm so glad you found that i i found that so interesting the other day um hey hey justin we got a question which i think actually now is a good time we're we're getting close to the two hour mark i think uh rob if you still have some if you still have some time do you have some time for some questions yeah i could probably go to another 45 minutes or so okay um, Justin, I'm going to have this for you because I, I think you answered this or, or we talked about this in last stream or, or two weeks ago. I can't remember, but this is from, uh, and by the way, brothers and sisters, if you want to ask a question, now's the time, uh, this is, um, do, do it in actually in all caps. This is like the one time that it's actually, uh, a okay to type in all caps. Um, that's so the moderators can see it a little easier, but this is from Cynthia MacArthur, MacArthur. Question, could it be that rejecting Torah is the strong delusion that some will be given? Thank you. Justin. Yes, yes, that's a great question. Um, we actually did cover that in the last live stream last Friday night. And I, I believe it's 2 Thessalonians. Um, I can't remember the chapter and verse off the top of my head. But actually, we, we went through the actual context of that verse. Um, and it, it specifically is saying that the lawless one will come. And um, that right after that, because people are are basically hard headed and persisting in sin, that the Lord is going to give them basically give them a strong delusion. And then the very next verse, it says it basically spells out that 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 delusion is that they will continue in unrighteousness. And so we dissected the word uh, used there uh, for continuing in unrighteousness, and it was essentially just continue breaking the law. So. Um, I, we believe, I think Adam and I are in agreement that the strong delusion is lawlessness, is is the idea that, um, well, a combination of things, not just lawlessness in and of itself that might be too oversimplified. We think it could come through the, in the form of a uh, of a uh, sort of a new age Christianity, a, a one world religion of some sort, um, or some sort of antichrist agenda 
driven um, religion that everyone kind of falls for. That could be the, the vehicle that the lawlessness is, is used to uh, deliver it to us with. But yeah, long story short, we believe that it is lawlessness of some, some kind. I yeah, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I certainly agree with that. Um, I have come to believe that the spinning heliocentric globular Earth is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. And everything you said, I agree with. And, and the context of that, that uh, chapter is the Antichrist, the beast, the lawless one. You know, and uh, on a side note, why is it such a big deal? The, you know, law, if the law has been done away with and we don't need to worry about the law, why should we be concerned with the lawless one? Everybody's lawless, right? We have no law. Uh, you know, that, that's number one. Um, so the context is the beast. And we know in Revelation that the beast number is 666. And, mm -hmm. you know, the more I started investigating the, the whole flat earth stuff and looking into the globe model and th this number 666 is all over the place. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. I even heard, I, I saw somebody that took the, you know, the, um, our English letters alphabet and assigning numerical value to them. And the National Aeronautics and Space Administration adds up to 666. Wow. <laughs> That was an interesting one. I was like, oh, that doesn't surprise me, but, you know, that's just interesting. But the globe itself, you know, at eight inches per mile squared is what you need for curvature to be, you know, a 25,000 mile circumference ball is, you know, eight inches is 0.66 of a foot, you know, and each, you know, iteration, 10, 100, you know, it's all 666. Um, when Doug Hamp was trying to say that the circle of the earth in Isaiah 40, 22 is actually the orbit of the earth. I'm right. like, and this guy has a PhD, right? I'm like, really? So I'm like, well, how fast is the Earth orbiting around the sun? So I just did a Google on it, right? And it said 18.6 miles per second. I said, why is it saying per second? So I did times 60 seconds, times 60 minutes. Well, what do you know? It's 66,600 yeah. miles per hour, you know? <laughs> oh. And, uh, you know. It was you know, the axis, right? It's also the inverse axis is 666 also. Well, yeah, you know, the, 23 .4. the axis is 23.4 off, right. off of a 90 degree angle. So 90 subtract 23.4. Uh, 24 point whatever is it, 20 what is it 24 point six 24 point uh 26 whatever 24 24 yeah. point six. I, you know, I just blanked i just blanked whatever 20, it is 26.4 me yeah i don't 24, know 24.6 whatever it is yeah uh, forgive me i just went blank on it but what if you subtract the number that they tell us the earth is the tilt is from 90 degrees it's 66.6 and and you know not isaac newton got bonked on the head and come up with a theory of gravity you know after an apple clunks him in the head in the year 1666. And it's like, it's just over and over <laughs> and over again. These numbers kept coming up and I'm going, wow. I mean, at some point you have to just say, this can't just be coincidence. Right. Mm -hmm. And so right. then when, when I look up the, uh, the word, uh, if I remember right, delusion, it was a uh, planeo or planeo, something like that. Um, actually, if you go back to, uh, uh, Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, you know, what's going to be like in the last days, you know, what, before you come back. And he says, the first thing he says is, let no man deceive you. Mm -hmm. Well, You look up the word, it's, and I, I believe it's planeo. Um, there's planeo, planetes. It, it, all of it is the root word from, the, from which we get the word planet in English. Right. So, and the word means to wander from truth, to, to, to draw people away from truth, you know. And so, it reminds me of the book of Jude where he talks about wandering stars that are reserved for judgment. And I'm like wandering stars. Well, you know, that's the planets, you know, they, to the eye, it looks like another star, but it happens to be moving, you know, throughout the year, you can track it. Right. So they call them wandering stars. Why, why does God need to judge a rock? Right. Why does God need to judge a gas planet <laughs> or, you know, fireball? I mean, Unless it's a sentient being that did something wrong, right? And so, you know, all of these things were adding up to me to 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 the thought that the great deception, the strong delusion that God sends, by the way, mm -hmm. it says because you don't have a love of the truth, God will send a powerful delusion because you would rather follow the Antichrist, who I believe is known by many names, Apollo being one of them, most notably in Revelation nine eleven, Apollo Abaddon, right? Uh, the number is 666. So I'm going, well, if that's the case and God sent the delusion, I mean, he, he, he turns you over to a reprobate mind. He says, you don't want to listen to me. You don't want to believe me. Okay, fine. Have it your way. Right. right. Yeah, and he sends you off into whatever reprobate mind idea that you had. He says, okay, there you go. Mm -hmm. And so 
for me, you know, trying to prove whether the earth was flat or round, you know, going out, trying to test all things and, and get out there and do various, you know, tests that we did and launching balloons and spending lots of money. And it was, the, the results were, uh, how shall we say inconclusive. And the reason I say that is because whatever your, your prior belief going into it is, if you believe the earth's a globe, then what you see is confirmation of that for you. Mm -hmm. If you believe the earth is flat, then what you see is confirmation for you. I mean, both sides can make up excuses using refraction or gravity. Typically, those are the two, you know, for why they explain what we saw. It actually works both ways. Right. You know, like with the uh, Chicago skyline uh, experiment that Rick Hummer and I did, we realized, well, yeah, curvature math says this, but so does refraction also says this. So if I can get the exact same results on a flat plane of water with refraction, then it doesn't necessarily ipso facto mean the reason the city is not showing is because of curvature. It could just simply be because of all that moisture, you know, 46 miles between me and Chicago. Right. Right. So what, what it came to me was, is if we're talking about a strong delusion that God sent because mm -hmm. you don't believe his word to begin with, then guess what, Rob, Justin, nobody's going to, nobody's going to undo that. Right. <laughs> you know, they right. have to believe first and then they will see it, right. it's not going to work the other way. Right. Yeah. Hey, I'm looking at this uh, 4106 from Strong's. Yeah, uh, there you go. Bonnet. And yeah, you I mean, this, this is a really, really interesting point you're making here. Um, it, it's interesting. It says a wandering, um, a delusion. Uh, and right here, actually, in the first little section, it says um, deviant behavior, departure from what God says is true. And uh, obviously, you know, we know what the word of God says about this specific topic, um, an error which results in wandering. It says here in parentheses, running into sin, but that's, of course, uh, somebody's in input, but a wandering. Um, interesting. Very, very interesting. From the feminine of planos. Yeah. Huh. yeah. But yeah, definitely it brings to mind, you know, uh, the, the transgressing planets, the wandering stars, the uh, transgressing stars and all that. It's, it's interesting. You guys both brought this up, uh, you know, with, with Jude and what's really interesting. I, I, th I think a lot of people have pointed this out, but in the second letter of Peter, what's really interesting is very similar wording, very similar thought processes uh, were in both the, the second, second Peter letter and Jude, you can almost put them together, but I just want to share a couple things. Um, uh, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. This is interesting. And I want to share uh, one more uh, one more thing after this. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And I think we're seeing that right now. And in their greed, they will exploit exploit you with false words. We're seeing that right now. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Now, this is also it's really interesting. It kind of ties in what you guys were just talking about. For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Um, anyways, I don't, I don't want to keep going there, but really interesting stuff. And I'm going to read, uh, you know, Rob, I don't know how you feel about this book. It's something that I'm still testing. Uh, the channel, we, we've shared this these scriptures with the channel quite a bit. Um, I know, uh, I know you're very familiar with with Dr. Pigeon's work, and you know, speaking of, you know, flat Earth, obviously he's not on board with us, but I do think he does have a lot of wisdom in other areas. Uh, we're going to be bringing him on in a few weeks, uh, and actually, we're going to be highlighting the Ascension uh, of Isaiah, also called the Vision of Isaiah. I don't know if you had a chance to read this book, um, but it, it it actually pinpoints this very time right now, and it's actually really interesting. It kind of goes hand in hand with that Second Peter I just read. But uh, bear with me just a minute. I want to read through this. And then I want to, it'll actually talk a little bit about the Antichrist. And I think there's some words in here that we may need to at least just consider, um, you know, for what the day is coming ahead. But, and, and, and that many who believe in him will speak through the Holy Spirit and many signs and wonders will be wrought in those days. And then, now this is talking about to these days. And afterward, on the eve of his approach, his disciples will forsake the teachings of the 12 apostles and their faith, and their love, and their purity, and there will be much contention on the eve of his advent and his approach. We're seeing that right now, obviously, especially in the body. And in those days, many will love office, though devoid of wisdom, and there will be many lawless elders, 
and shepherds dealing wrongly by their own sheep, and they will ravage them owing to their not having holy shepherds. And many will change the honor of the garments of the saints for the garments of the covetous. And there will be much respect of persons in those days and lovers of the honor of this world. And there will be much slander and vainglory at the approach of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit will withdraw from many. And there will not be in those days many prophets, nor those who speak trustworthy words, save one here and one there in diverse places, on the account of the spirit of error and fornication and of vainglory and of covetousness, which shall be in these who will be called servants of that one, and in those who will receive that one. Just like Yeshua said, you know, many will come in my name saying I am Christ, which I don't think he meant, you know, many will, will claim to be the Messiah, but many will be claim, you know, that they believe in Yeshua, that they are one of his disciples. So same thing here. And there will be great hatred in the shepherds and elders elders towards each other. Wow, are we seeing this right now? Wow. Mm -hmm. For there will be great jealousy in the last days. For everyone will say what is pleasing in his own eyes. And I hate to say this. I, I'm just going to say it. But, you know, what we see sometimes is people will see that there's others that are following the commands. And for whatever reason, it makes them... I guess, I don't know, jealous or makes them feel convicted that, oh, maybe I'm not doing something. And then so instead of, you know, maybe saying, hey, maybe, you know, let's search this out a little bit. Let's reason together. They'll just lash out, you know, right here for great jealousy for everyone will say what is pleasing in his own eyes. And they will make of none effect the prophecy of the prophets, which were before me. And these, my visions also, they will make of none effect in order to speak after the impulse of their own hearts. Now, let me read just a little bit here further. And this talks a little bit about the Antichrist. There's some words here. And again, brothers and sisters, I, I you know, with, with caution here, it's called the, the Ascension of Isaiah, the vision of Isaiah. I'm still testing this. And again, Dr. Pigeon will be on in a few weeks and we're going to go through this book. And he does believe it is inspired. Uh, so chapter four, and now Hezekiah and Joseph, my son, these are actually, let me just, uh, yeah. Okay. These are the days of the completion of the world. And after it's con consummated, Belier, the great ruler, this is what they call Satan in this book, Belier, the great ruler, the king of this world will descend who hath ruled it since it came into being. Yea, he will descend from his firmament in the likeness of a man, a lawless king, the slayer of his mother, who himself, even this king will persecute the plant which the 12 apostles of the beloved have planted. Of the 12, one will be delivered into his hands. This ruler in the form of that king will come there and will, I'm sorry, and will come. There's some tra bad translation here. And there will come with him all the powers of this world, and they will hearken unto him all that he desires. And at his word, remember the lying signs and wonders? And at his word, the sun will rise at night, and he will make the moon to appear at the sixth hour. And all that he hath desired, he will do in the world, and he will speak like the beloved. So remember, Justin, you were saying this false Christianity? Yep. He will do and speak like the beloved, and he will say, I am God, and before me there has been none. So I really believe that he's going to come and say that he is Christ, Yeshua, or you know whatever. But he says it's right here that he will speak like the beloved. That's Yeshua. And all the people of the world will believe in him and they will sacrifice to him and they will serve him saying, this is God and beside him there is no other. And they greater number of those who shall have been associated together in order to receive the beloved will turn aside after him. So this is where it says, you know, remember we use that, you use that word many or Yeshua use that word many. Mm -hmm. Well, it says right here, many will turn over. The greater number will turn over to him. I'm assuming thinking that he is Messiah. And there will be the power of his miracles in every city and region, and he will set up his image before him in every city, and he shall bear sway three years and seven months and 27 days. And many believers and saints, having seen him for whom they were hoping, who was crucified, Jesus the Lord Christ, after that I, Isaiah, had seen him, who was crucified and ascended, and those also who were believers of him, of these few in those days will be left as his servants while they flee from desert to desert awaiting the coming of the beloved. So I know there's a lot there, but I wow. really felt it was on my heart to share that. There's That's some things there that a lot of us have not seen or heard before. Um, so really just continuing to test this book uh, as it's been impressed on my heart. Yeah, that's uh, well, first of all, I, I really enjoyed meeting Dr. Pigeon at the um, take on the world conference back in, I think it was August. Uh, you know, he's not on the page with uh, biblical cosmology, right. which just floors me. 
because as, as, as smart as he is, and especially having done as much work as he did with the Book of Enoch, which tells you point blank. I mean, it's, I don't know how much clearer it could possibly be. But anyway, he's a good brother, you know, and I actually had some time to chat with him a little bit at the conference. So, uh, yeah, great guy. I've never seen that before. You called it the uh, Ascension of Isaiah? It's called the uh, in, uh, different um, different sites have different names for it. It's, it's either called the Ascension of Isaiah um, or the vision of Isaiah. And one really neat, uh, one really, really neat point of reference, Rob, is you know how in, in Hebrews 11, I can't remember what verse, but it talks about how the different prophets, uh, they were stoned. And then it says they were sawn asunder. And a lot of us know that that was Isaiah, that he was literally cut in half. Mm -hmm. But, um, this is the only piece of scripture, uh, that actually discusses that, uh, Isaiah was sawn in half. Now, I know that the Talmud, I believe, says it as well, but I don't believe that the writer of Hebrews was referencing the the, the Talmud for, for that uh, piece of scripture. But in uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, it's mentioned three times about how he was uh, cut, sawn asunder or cut in half, if you will. So uh, wow. neat, little, neat little tie in there. Wow. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, piggyback on the, the Great Deception here. This was from a presentation I gave in um, uh, Canada back in August and talking about let no man deceive you. That's in Matthew 24. And the word there is uh, Strong's 4105 planeo lead astray, deceive lead astray, cause to wander properly to go astray, get off course to deviate from the correct path, roaming into error, wandering, be misled. It is the root word for our English term planet or wandering body. So, you know, when you look into that, you, know, you got the 4105 planeo, you have uh, plan A, 4106, same thing, wandering the air. These are just different derivatives of the same word. And planos, uh, again, same thing, mislead, deceive, wandering uh, into error. And so he's talking about wandering stars there. That's planetes or planets. You know, so we're literally saying, when we say planet Earth, we're saying the wandering deceptive Earth by the definitions of the words. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You know, and that's just crazy. And then when you look at that passage that we're trying to figure out, it does in Second Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. It says, for this reason, because they would rather follow the lawless one and they don't have a love of the truth. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion. Again, that's the word plan A, 4106, mm -hmm. the same derivative. A powerful, powerful plan A. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, that's a, you know, and I talked about a lot of that in my first book, Babylon Rising, and so much of the you know, different characters of history to go back to Nimrod and mm -hmm. the Antichrist being 666. And, you know, this is some of the things we we're just talking about. This is the Google search I did, you know, the earth is going at 18.5 miles per second, you know, at 66,600 curvature, you know, starting to say uh, that. That's just coincidence, man. Just, yeah, yeah. it's, it's 23.4. That was a number, number <laughs> we couldn't think of before. 23 before. I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, at, at what point do we say, you know, and there's another guy who uh, he's not a flat earther, but he's done some other very interesting work. He believes the globe, but he found that from the coastline of Antarctica to various locations like the obelisk in the Vatican, you know, uh, into the temple in Jerusalem and various, the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. Uh, are 660 or 6,660. I think this is nautical miles, if I remember right. Uh, coincidence, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know, this guy, you know, everybody wants to say he's a Christian, Isaac Newton, because he knew the Bible. Well, I mean, newsflash, Satan knows the Bible, too. Uh, you know, this guy, you look into him, and he's a Rosicrucian, a Freemason, an alchemist. Uh, you know, this guy was seriously into the, the uh, occult. You look into the Apollo program, and, you know, there are supposedly six successful missions with two men on the surface. Well, you know. Uh, isn't it interesting that of all of humanity, only 12 apostles, 12 apostles of Apollo are the ones who supposedly stood on another rock besides the earth. And they had one betrayer, which was Gus Grissom. He was actually supposed to be the first man to step on the moon. He was slotted to be the first man. And uh, he's, he's like, this ain't happening. You know, the, he's like, we're at least a decade away from this happening. He, he hung a lemon on the on the capsule in mm -hmm. protest. And, and he got in trouble for having an unauthorized press conference saying, you know what, this isn't going to work, you know? And he told his wife, you know, if there's an accident, if there's ever an accident, it's going to be me. Right. Well, hmm. you know, he was, he was a betrayer of the program and paid a price for it. And his own son uh, to this day maintains that his dad was murdered and Gus Grissom and white, uh, Ed White and Roger Chaffee burned alive on the pad on, on uh, Apollo one on the same day that the international community signed the international space treaty. So mm -hmm. I'm like, 
Well, that seems like it was a treaty signed in blood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12 apostles, 6 and 6, number 13. Only 12 humans allegedly stood on another rock. Out of the Apollo missions, only 18 participated in the alleged moon landings with six mission commanders, six command module pilots, six lunar lander pilots. Wow. Wow. It really, you know, and then when you look at Apollo 13, everything centers around a 13, which is a big Osiris number. The mission was Apollo 13. There are 13 letters in Apollo mission. It launched at 13, 13 hours, 1, 13 p.m. Houston time on 4, 11, 70. You add those up, it equals 13 from pad 39, 3 plus 9, right? Or 13, but no, uh, 39 is 13 plus 13 plus 13. Mm. Explosion happened on April 13th, a moon day, Monday, shortly after the crew did a a 49-minute broadcast, 4 plus 9 is 13, about how well everything was going. They signed off and, whoop, Houston, we have a problem. And the orbiter was named Odyssey. In book 13 of Homer's Odyssey, Odysseus is ushered safely home after 20 years' worth of journeys. Yeah, it's it's probably all a coincidence. I mean, this this organization is a cult through and through. Some people wonder, was NASA just created to hide God? Well, you've probably seen this meme that the word NASA, or the, or the, the acronym at NASA is a Hebrew word that means deceive. That's actually not really true. It is partially true. It depends on, I don't know if you can see this right here, this little dot on the top right of the shin. Mm-hmm. The dot is typically either over the left or the right. When it's over the right, as it is in verse uh, uh, Genesis 3.13, when the serpent beguiled, that's the word right there, it's mm-hmm. pronounced nasha. The, the mm-hmm. shin is a sh sound. Mm-hmm. The next time it is used is when the, the little dot is over the left side, and that's when you say NASA or NASA. And that's mm-hmm. where Cain says his punishment is greater than he can bear. So I'm like, isn't it interesting the context in which both first appear? Nasha in reference to Eve being deceived by the serpent, and NASA in reference to Cain's punishment after killing Abel. And the word means to lift up or to bear. Uh, mm-hmm. so like uh, lifting up to deceive? Right. Uh, don't be silly. You can trust us. <laughs> right. so, I mean, wow. What a crazy world we live in. Wow. It's, it's so crazy <laughs> that people want to put their faith and trust, especially creationists and so-called Bible believers, want to put the word of NASA over what the scriptures say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and they're trying to force the Bible into fitting science. You know, right. we, That starts with the premise that science is correct. So therefore, we have to try to force all those verses that don't seem right in the Bible to somehow magically fit what science says. And Paul warned, he said, listen, you know, people, he talks about avoid vain babblings and science falsely so-called, which some believing have erred concerning the faith. Mm, That's right. So so it's a pretty huge issue. Yeah. We we have a question. this is from Jamie Cranmo. What's going on, sister? Um, how do you gr- how do you grieve the Holy Spirit? How would you guys define grieving the Holy Spirit? Well, you know, I, I forget where that verse is actually, but um, so I'd have to look up in the context of it. But just off the top of my head, my thought would be doing that which is against what the Holy Spirit would lead you to do. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. or not listening to the Holy Spirit's prompting when you feel that prompting to do something and you don't do it, you know, I think that, you know, that's what it feels like to me. Again, I'd have to look up the verse itself. It's uh, yeah. Ephesians four. I just pulled it up. Hang on. Let me just read the the context of it real quick. It's Ephesians four thirty. Let me just look at, uh, let's see. Um, all right. I'll start at verse 28. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands. The thing which is good that he may, have to give to him that needeth let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers and grieve not the holy spirit of god whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god for christ's sake hath forgiven you that yep. pretty much answers it right there, right there in the verse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the Holy Spirit is grieved when we're attacking one another. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if there's any more questions. Worse still, when you're attacking, we're attacking one another for wanting to obey God. Like, I know. You're going to attack for that? It's, you know, actually, I wanted to share a question with you. Um, 
one of my uh, one of our friends uh, actually has been um, investigating um, what he, he believes the Lord has put on his heart for I, I think almost two years now, and um, I wanted to get your input on it and just see if you've seen this or, or considered it. Um, and he wanted me to specifically share with you Revelation thirteen thirteen, and uh, ask you to consider the Falcon Nine rocket as being fire being brought down in the sight of men so as to deceive. Um, because he, he was, uh, one of, one of his teachings is that the ISS is actually the eighth, um, wandering star because it's up in the actually, it's actually up in the heavenly realms with the other wandering stars, the seven. Mm. Um, and, uh, there's a, there's a ton of, a ton of teaching he does on that. But anyway, I was, I was just wondering if you had ever seen that, heard of that or investigated that. Mm -mm, no, that's intriguing, but no, I have not. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got a question for um, question for that's that's got to be for Brother Joe, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which I love, Brother Joe. What's going on in the chat? Love you, man. Hey, uh, this is a question for Rod. This is from Truth Through Christ. Do you think the alien agenda will be used to cover up the rapture? For example, they will say Christians have been abducted. Also, Adam, how can I contact you about being baptized? Okay, I'll, I'll put my e uh, email in the chat for you. Uh, there was a time when I did believe that. I no longer believe in the pre-trib rapture, so I almost think it's going to be the reverse of that. Mm -hmm. I think people may be taken up or disappeared or whatever, and the story may be that they have been raptured. You know, I I, I used to be a hardcore pre-trib rapture. I apologize if this is controversial on your channel. I don't mean No, 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 we're, we're in one accord. We're in one okay. accord. Yeah, we're great uh, exodus people. Yeah, greater access. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's tough, man. I mean, it's I can't even say hello without starting a fire somewhere. <laughs> it's always going to be controversial because uh, there are all these sacred cows. But, yeah, I'm not a preacher of rapture guy anymore. When I did believe in the preacher of rapture, that was one of the thoughts that, you know, I shared with others that had that similar view. But, I, you know, I actually do believe that there's that we are rapidly approaching some sort of disclosure event mm -hmm. that will deal with or it would be a complete lie. But that that it will center around the idea of aliens that will probably try to pass themselves off as our creators, mm -hmm. uh, the Anunnaki and what have you. Uh, so, I, you know, that's one of the reasons why I think this whole biblical cosmology has come to the surface now of all times. Right. 21st century of all times. We're, we're talking about really we're talking about the Truman Show um, yeah. b because with that model. All of the stuff that we have been seeing in pop culture and even in certain Christian circles and various prophecy ministries that still subscribe to the Copernican principle and the ever-expanding universe model, which leaves open the likelihood, not just the possibility or plausibility, but the likelihood that there's other life forms out there. Right. You know, right. To the point where the Catholic Church is even saying, hey, you know, yeah, we may have something to learn from them because <laughs> there's infinite <laughs> worlds out there and infinite well, possibilities hey. and maybe maybe some of those guys didn't fall you know they had a they didn't they didn't fall from grace like we did in in sin and so oh, we may gosh. have something to learn from them i mean you actually have a, a vatican astronomer saying you know hey yeah we'll baptize the aliens if right. they need it, but we may have something to learn from them i mean th talk about priming for a false gospel right there yeah not to yeah. mention anyone familiar with the just the, the idea of um, the watchers causing that that sort of deceit um, and they, and they've been, they've been doing that obviously for a long time. Um, just looking back at, and I, I hate to bring up the, the ancient alien stuff, but that's, that's essentially what it, what it comes back to is the, yeah. the Babylonian, uh, gods and, and where that stuff really stems from with, with the, the watchers and the fallen, the fallen angels, so to speak. And, um, you know, anyone like with their awareness, um, they already have an awareness of all that stuff, hearing what the, what the Pope is basically saying, He's basically saying, like, get ready for those false gods to come back again so we can accept them. Like, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, we're being right. primed for it. We're, but the Catholic Church is all over this. They they have, you know, the, the Pope even. I mean, in their worldview, I don't share this worldview, but in their worldview, the, co the, the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's the <laughs> right. master of Christ here on earth. And so you have, in their worldview, uh, the vicar of Christ saying, yeah, evolution, you know. We, we, we yeah, big bang evolution yeah you know 
God did it, but yeah, we, we should still embrace that. And oh, by the way, aliens could be coming and we'll baptize them if they need it. But we may need to listen to them, actually. They may have a, a you know a, a, a better, higher plane of spirituality than we do. So you mm -hmm. have the Catholic Church doing that. Then you have the, you know, so the mainstream evangelical Christian prophecy ministries out there talking about, you know, uh, um, moon bases on the other side of the, the dark side of the moon and Antarctica and spaceships underground and the Nazis run to there and there's, you know, spaceships and, the, you know, they're talking. Right. So, I mean, you have these guys who are, they're this close, man. They're like six inches from the finish line talking about, you know, they talk about Admiral Bird, They talk about hollow earth. They talk about all the weirdness in Antarctica, but they don't yeah. go to, they don't finish the story. And, and all the stuff that they're saying is in the context of the possibility of sentient beings coming now they will argue because I was in that camp that that w whatever comes will be false. So it'll, it'll be fallen angels, demonic nephilim type activity right. passing themselves off. Uh, but they still leave open the possibility that there are other life forms because they believe in the ever expanding universe model. Um, you have Torah people who who and they're worse than Christians on this. They, you know, they bash me for for talking about flat earth because they you know many people have seen my work on torah so as a result different people come out of pagan christianity into torah as a result of the virtual house church and other things that we've put out uh, mm -hmm. but then they find out that i'm a crazy flat earther so it just ruins everything you know so they oh, come yeah. out i'm like i just moses you want to blame somebody blame moses he he started it genesis chapter <laughs> one <laughs> you're not going to find a spinning heel or centric ball in genesis one so you know you have all of these things happening, and th that's in the religious side of things. Mm -hmm. In the secular side of things, you've got you know people like Dr. Stephen Greer uh, with the Disclosure Project, and they've been talking for years now that you know disclosure is imminent any day now. The, they're going to and UFOs are uh, uh, exponentially sightings are increasing exponentially every year. So all of this is leading up to a, a big reveal, frankly, any day now. And right. that's why I think this top the cos biblical cosmology is important because it nullifies all of it. Right. Right. And you, we're not going to believe you, it. Do you right. think that's part of even even if it were possible, the elect could be deceived, but it's not possible? I, well, I said I don't think it's not possible. I think it is very much possible. That's why both Peter and Yeshua uh, and Paul, others, various people said, don't be deceived. Let no man deceive you. If it was not possible to be deceived, they'd have no reason to say, don't let anybody deceive you. <laughs> right, right, right. I, I actually think it but is I'm saying, I'm saying the knowledge of, of Flat Earth, of biblical cosmology, do you think that that, is, that, it, that, that was sent by the Father to, to give to those that would receive it yeah, some I sort do. of um, a different lens, if you would, for these end times and, and, and how things play out? Yeah, I, I can only speak from my own personal experience with God on this issue is because I prayed for a year and a half when I was struggling with it. I didn't want to embrace it. And I kept praying, to, not like boo-hoo-hoo, but crying, you know, praying fervently to the point where your eyes start watering and like, God, what do I what do I do with this? I see what your word says, but yet I believe. I want to believe. I'm going to be Luke Skywalker one day. I want to go to where no man has gone before. I want to be Captain Kirk. You know, I want to believe in that space stuff. And his only answer to me was I said what I said for a year and a half, praying every night. You know, wow. I said what I said. And then when I finally did that Lake Michigan test, I continued the same prayers, but the answer changed from I said what I said to, are you going to believe me now, Rob, or what? Yeah. And it, it was like the, or what part that kind of really scared me. And I finally just said, you know what? Yeah. You know, let God be true and every man a liar. I'm just, there are questions I still have to this day, but I'm going to embrace this father because I believe that there is a reason why this is happening today. And the, I don't know, I think I have it here. I think my wife has it. Uh, the book Terra Firma, this one here. Yeah. <clears throat> this book right here, Terra Firma, Earth Not a Planet, Proof from Scripture, Reason, and Fact by David Wardlaw Scott. This is written by a, a dear old man in the Lord who's at the tail end of his life. He can barely see. He, he writes in the beginning of it how, how much this was a labor of love, trying to put it together, how difficult it was for him to do so. And he just takes like a rock solid firm stand on the scriptures. And in the end, he's like, I am firmly convinced that modern astronomy is of Satan. I mean, he just comes right out. Modern mm -hmm. time, this is 1901, right? Wow. And at the end of it, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. If you guys haven't read this book, you got to read this book. Yeah. Uh, at, the, at the end of this book, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he basically said, I've done what I felt I was called to do. and it, I, And now, dear reader, it's up to you, you know, wow. and when I read this book, ooh, 
man, I mean, it felt like God shot an arrow out of heaven right into my heart. And it, it felt like this old man was reaching through time from 1901, holding out the baton saying, are you going to take it? And I just wept, man. I just started, I just wow. Started, wow. like almost uncontrollably like, really God, well, you, you certainly took it. <laughs> you certainly took it. I, I did take it, but that's why is because here's a guy, old guy at the end of his life, taking a firm. I mean, he inspired me. I can't, I don't know what else you say when you, when you yeah. look at what this guy was up against and he's at the, you know, in, in 1901, this is right at sort of the Zenith of, of evolution starting to take hold. I mean, it was right, only right. 50 years prior or so that, uh, you know, Darwin and Huxley and Charles yeah. Lyell and all of that stuff. And Einstein, you know, it's coming right into that whole Einstein uh, yeah. time frame. Yeah. And here's a, here's a guy just saying, you know what, I'm going to take a stand on scripture and he, here's what science says. Here's what God says. That's, the timing of that is fascinating too, because that's right as um, the, um, the Schofield reference Bible came along and was actually advocating for gap theory um, and in a large part due to the, the Darwinian evolutionary the theologies that were kind of developing at the time. And so that, that Bible actually helped pave the way for opening that day-age theory that a lot of Christians still, still subscribe to, you know, that every day of the uh, creation model was actually a thousand years or a million years or whatever, or the gap theory, which is between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 is a billion years. Um, and that was just kind of coming into fruition. So it's interesting that that God would use a man like that to provide that book right as we right when we needed it to the most, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know, he, he, before him it was uh, Samuel Robotham with uh, Zetetic Astronomy, right? Gleason. There are several guys in the late 1800s that were taking the stand, and he's he's the first that I read in the 20th century, 1901. Um, but there's others. F. E. Pash has 50 Reasons Copernicus of the Bible, written in 1915. It's a real short book, awesome read. And uh, Kings Dethroned by uh, Gerard Hickson, uh, 1922. I'm actually taking all three of those books right now. We're, we're in, the, in the editing process right now, finalizing the book. But I've taken all three of those books and put them into one volume that I'm giving commentary on. Because awesome. it is, it's. I just think it's really important that people understand that that yes, there has been a dominant worldview for 500 years, but there has always been a remnant. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the remnant, yeah, there are some interesting people and charlatans and stuff in there, certainly. But there's also true men of God, in my opinion, that are just trying to take a stand on the word of God. And it seems like they've always been there, but they were in the extreme minority. You know, the remnant usually is, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I felt like, wow, you know, that's, I'm in good company if I join that crowd. You know? Right. Right. I look at these guys as uh, these are forerunners and, you know, please, I help me to be as, as firm and as, and stand as strong on the word as these guys did. Right. Right. Man. Well, you know, I, I really think that's, it's really interesting because the more we discuss this, the more I realize that, you know, the, uh, this kind of surface level breakdown of strong delusion that, that I provided at, at a glance actually, um, now digging into the strong delusion, you know, as, as presented by you, we see that without the, um, the kind of the, the quote unquote heliocentric scientific strong delusion, uh, the, that actually becomes the, the, uh, the worldview that the antichrist lawless one actually descends to, to, to live in, to exist in. And without that, um, the lawlessness couldn't really exist. So, I think that's really interesting. Well, yeah, especially in light of the the vision of uh, or the ascension of Isaiah that was read earlier. Mm -hmm. Wow! I would love for you to continue to test that, but uh, oh, yeah. you know, stay tuned. I guess Dr. Pigeon has done a lot of research on this book. Um, wow. The little bit of research I did, I think it showed that it, it was written in 120 AD. Um, I mean, even if that's the truth, I mean, nothing other than the Holy Spirit could could pinpoint everything we just read about like right now it literally just painted the entire picture of what's going on right now on the eve of his approach um it's it's just it's mind-blowing but um the entire book is actually awesome um and uh yeah i I'd really love for you to test it and and uh get some further comments from you on that one yeah
Well, you know, my take on stuff like that is like, look, the the this I am very content with the sixty six as being the divinely inspired words of God. Other scriptures or other texts that are outside of that, and and of course the eighty books was originally in the King James Bible, so I, right. I, I would extend that. I'm I'm confident in in the authenticity of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on those books. Other books, I love reading those other books. I got lots of them right here that I read. And, uh, you know, my take is chew the meat, toss the bones kind of thing. There you go. Pray, ask for discernment. And where it agrees with Scripture, great. It just elaborates and, and expands my understanding of it. If it contradicts with Scripture, then, okay, then I toss that out. You know? Right. We were just saying the other day, like, uh, for example, like Jasher and Jubilees, um, yeah. we both believe they're inspired books, but there's one little part where Jasher uh, conflicts with Jubilees and, and conflicts, you know, one little thing on Genesis. And so, you know, Justin and I concluded, do we throw out the entire book? Well, no. Um, you know, but like you said, uh, I, I like, what was that saying? Uh, Chew the meat, spit out the bones? Yeah. yeah. I like that. I like that. That's good. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> um, someone asked, what about the Apocrypha? That's actually what we're saying. Um there was a, there was 14 books of the apocrypha is that right yeah yeah mm -hmm. and, and and again like we said earlier in the broadcast uh, those books uh, came along with the start of this country um the 1520 the 1599 geneva bibles uh, all had those those books which again was like second Ezra's, baruch um mm -hmm. tobit i love tobit what a great book uh, mm -hmm. and, and many others but uh, those are some of the books we're talking in, in second Ezra's, i did a study on this a couple months ago now but in second Ezra's chapter 14 it talks about how, um, number one, it goes back to Moses, and God said that Moses wrote way more books than 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 we knew about. So many were hid from, uh, many were hid and given only to the wise. But when Ezra was charged with rewriting all the scriptures because everything had gotten burnt with the destruction of, of Jerusalem, uh, Ezra was in charge of rewriting all scripture. He and five others were given the Holy Spirit temporarily to rewrite all the scriptures. Um, it was said that 204 books were written and only 24 were given publicly and the rest were all to be hidden. And what's interesting is that came true because you had 24 books, the Tanakh, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, you know, we, we know that it turns into 40 books, I think in, in our old Testament, just because, you know, they break up first Kings and second Kings, whereas in the Tanakh, it's just, you know, one book and, and you know, things like that. But it's just really interesting that that came true. So with that being said, there's, a lot of books out there that you know are inspired or scrolls that are inspired that we just don't even know about so that's why i'm apt to test a lot of these things because of that research realizing that hey you know there's there's a lot more out there than just uh, the the canon in the um the apocrypha but definitely tread that's why i always give like a warning try tread lightly or uh, tread cautiously test it um you know don't just uh, take it um as inspired scripture but well like we said earlier test the spirits to see whether they be of god right. there, there's a they're, the Greeks had an understanding that in the arts, especially when it comes to writing, whether it's poetry or novels or plays or whatever, or music, you know, that uh, that it came from elsewhere. The inspiration, you know, that's, they called it the muses, right? You got to get in touch with your inner muse, right? Um, they had this understanding that inspiration came from elsewhere, which is why I believe Paul, writing to Greek culture, said that all scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So. Right. It's like on one hand, he's validating the notion that, yes, creative thought is very often inspired outside of us. But in the case of Scripture, that source is the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so when it comes to books in the so-called canon, first of all, you have to look into how canonization happened in the first place, where we got the canon from. Um, but my whole argument with people who really want to press things and get on to me for looking into Enoch, and I do consider Enoch to be inspired scripture. Yeah, me too. Um, we both know, do. Dude seem to. I'm actually working on a manuscript. Uh, I think it's down there where I'm going through um, the book of Enoch line by line and looking for where there are verses in the Bible that that find precedence in the book of Enoch. And there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like in the Torah, first of all, Genesis chapter 6. Moses throws out the word Nephilim and never explains it. He, well, I presuppose that he knew what the Nephilim were and that his audience did because he didn't need to explain it. And everybody's like, well, yeah, we know, you know, sons of God, we know what that, what that says, right? I mean, it's all, you get to the day of atonement and, you know, King James, all you get scapegoat. You don't know what he's talking about there. And you look in the Hebrew and you see that they're casting lots. What? For Azazel? It's what? only Enoch, right? It's only Enoch. Well, yeah, if you haven't read the book of Enoch, what is that, Leviticus 16, I think it is, wherever, when it talks about casting lots on the day of, you have no frame of reference for that except the book of Enoch. So 
I'm going through and finding, you know, things in Enoch and then making footnotes and commentary. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know when I'm ever going to finish this because it's like a never ending project. You know, it's just, there's a right. lot there. I mean, so much, there's so much there. Um, but here's my thing is people, well, that's not uh, canonized scripture. Well, okay. Show me in the Bible where God told anybody to make a Bible to limit the number to 66 or even 80, if you prefer, and get back to me. Right. Mm -hmm. When you, when you can show the divinely inspired, Holy Spirit inspired decree to collect manuscripts and turn them into a, and to put them in between covers, uh, worse still, many of them out of pigskin. That's even worse. But um, show me where that's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not there. When when uh, in the time of the Bible, they had a room that had a, it was a library of scrolls. And right. That was their Bible. It was a library of scrolls. You know, the only collection of books that were put into one was the Torah. The five books of Moses were put into one. Right. You know, everything else was individual scrolls all inside the walls there, you know. And so, you know, you, again, you just got to test all things. You got to, you know, you got to pray. And the the true sign of scripture is that it doesn't contradict itself. Right. Right. Yep. So. It, it, but there are, uh, scribal, there are scribal errors. I mean, that that's the, when we're looking at so-called scripture in English, okay, mm -hmm. that's where we're right. going to, Right. Hello, I'm talking about English, okay? For thousands of years removed from the original. So to, to yeah, find, about, yeah, to find a, a, errors and dates or ages or things like that, I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's actually the biggest critique I've received so far. I just put a video out called Before He Was Abraham, and it's uh, like a, a mini documentary of Abraham's life um, before Genesis 12. And uh, it's based on the book of Jubilees and Jasher. And that's one of the critiques I get is like, oh, well, Jasher disagrees with the age. Uh, he was, he left Haran. You know, I'm it like, doesn't. dude. It actually doesn't. I, I did a whole study on that. In fact, I'm ready. To, I'm, I, that's another book that I've been working on for a while uh, called Abraham versus Nimrod. Cause there's like hey, that's cool. You're going to like this video. <laughs> yeah. You should watch this video too. That Justin just did. It's awesome. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cause there's like 200 pages talking about, I mean, they're like the ultimate rivals, right? Yeah. Abraham. Abraham versus Nimrod. And the issue of when he left Tehran and all that is actually resolved by the book of Joshua. Was it the, the 50 years old or the 75 years old issue? Yeah. 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 Cause he does some back and forth. Right. Like, like his, his, he, he, his dad, he goes with his dad from early Chaldees to Haran. Well, right. Haran was both early Chaldees and Haran uh, were, uh, he was an idol maker. He, he made idols. Right. He was an idol maker. You know, and scripture even testifies to that, right? That his dad was an idol worshiper. He said uh, he made it with his own hands. Yeah, right. Well, he and and the patron god of Ur was a, a, a I think it was a moon god named Sin. Interestingly enough, Sin, uh, and the next headquarters of this particular deity was in Haran, which was named after his uh, son, his that got killed in the fiery furnace. Oh, uh, that's, that's a whole other issue. But uh, so they go there. And, you know, God's like doing a hello McFly on Abraham saying, look, I told you to leave your father, you know, but he went with his dad. So, and he goes to Canaan for a while and then comes back. And so there's some back and forth. But when the when the Genesis version of the story kicks in is on the return trip to Haran, God's like, OK, dude, I told you to get away from your dad. You need to get out. And that's what right. so that's right. Yeah, it's an elaboration. It's not a contradiction. Right. That's right at the end of Genesis 11 when that's happening. Where yeah, and you know what else is an elaboration, not a contradiction, is uh, Sarai being his niece, and his. Um, and in Scripture it says that it's his half sister, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't negate him still being her uncle because um, for someone to be considered a daughter of Abraham it doesn't necessarily mean the immediate daughter or not Abraham Tarak his father doesn't mean it's his immediate daughter. It could just be his granddaughter, his great granddaughter. You're still considered a daughter or son of Abra or of Tarak or whoever. And so the scriptures say it's uh, uh, Sarai is actually Haran's. I'm sorry. Um, uh, who is it? Tarak's uh, brother's daughter. I think. No. What is it? Uncle, what uncle it is. sister's mother. What's up? <laughs> I can't remember what it is, but essentially. Um, Haran, Haran's daughter. That's what it is. It's Haran's daughter. So it's literally Abraham's brother's daughter is is Sarai. Um, but that would also make her Tarak, Abraham's father's daughter as well. So it's 
you know, just because she's his half sister in in Genesis doesn't take away the fact that it's okay that she's also his niece according to Jubilees and Jasher. So, but it's interesting I, I, what you're doing with um, Enoch. I'm doing with Jubilees. I'm making just a ton of footnotes and showing where Genesis lines up with Jubilees, and it's just all over the place. It's it's everywhere. It completely lines up perfectly. It only provides a little more context. And, you know, both of those books, without an understanding of biblical cosmology, uh, there are places that make no sense at all, uh, mm -hmm. especially Enoch, chapter 72 to like 83. Because Enoch, what we call first Enoch now, is actually a compilation of several books, you know, the, the book of the Watchers, the book of parables. There's, there's several different books that make up first Enoch. Um, but from 70, 72 to 83 is like the, the book of the course of the heavenly luminaries. Makes no sense whatsoever if you believe in a spinning heliocentric globular Earth hurling through space. Right. That's complete gibberish. But as soon as you put it into the cosmological worldview that the ancients had of a Truman show style enclosed right. world, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. And uh, Zen Garcia has really done a great job of unpacking that. Uh, he's got a book he wrote called um, Flat Earth as Key to Decrypting the Book of Enoch. And mm. he just really goes deep into that that particular portion of Enoch, uh, really unpacking it. I and mean, it gives an extremely detailed model of a clock. You know, I mean, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Makes sense. It's that fascinating stuff. That Zen is actually, he, his work and your work is actually what woke me up. And I was I was following Zen a little bit uh, closely, more closely back then. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's mind-blowing stuff. And it really is. It really is a, a key to decrypt. Um, uh, well, flat Earth and flat Earth to dec decrypt Enoch. It's just amazing how they go hand in hand. Mm. It really is. Someone asked uh, just randomly, "Have you ever talked with or met Dr. Michael Brown?" Brown? No, I don't think so. Doesn't okay. sound familiar. Just I just saw that question, so I thought I'd ask. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had another one. Someone else had a question as well. Um, Let's see. I just happened to look over the chat room. It's pretty active. Holy yeah. Lord. Wow. Bounce around a little bit. There's a lot, there's a lot of action going on there. I can't usually look. Yeah. At well, it kind of went, it kind of went bananas as soon as you said pre-trib. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, you do, Rob. <laughs> like yeah. I said, I can't open my mouth without starting <laughs> fires. Which I, I do have a I do have a theory. I, um, I've, I think I've shared with you guys throughout uh, the last few months, and I I keep meaning to make a video on this to clarify, you know, my thoughts on this. But I, I, I'm I'm guessing there's some in the book of Enoch and in Second Ezra, there's there's a mention of multiple groups, um, and it shows how those that are remain till the end are saved and will see the salvation, but they'll also see the others that were taken up before the sight of everybody. I, I'll try to pull those up verses up real quick, but um, I'm, I'm assuming that that group, the first fruits is the, the 144,000 and there's some sort of event, I guess is what I'm, I'm, I'm postulating here. But um, anyways, yeah. So the chat went, went pretty crazy when, when that, uh, let me start talking about that. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Hey, this is a, this is a family. This is we're here. We're not always going to agree with each other, and I don't think there's, you know, I don't think there's one Christian out there that's going to agree with everything another another you know views. But that's we're to love we each other happened. regardless, and that's that's what I really just don't understand about those that are have been attacking you and have been attacking us. It's like, do you not read the scriptures? You know, hating a brother. You know, I just I just don't understand hating his laws that was. You know whether you whether you think that they're valid for us now or not. How how do you how do you stomach the thought of just speaking so ill against another brother um, that confesses in this crazy world where you know it, it's we confess Jesus Christ Yeshua with our mouth. You know how, how what what is inside of you that makes you want to hate us? Because I don't I, I don't know about you. Maybe I, maybe I'm sheltered from this. I don't see it, but I don't see people that believe in Torah going out there and like you know smacking people around with it you know like like some people like to call it you know flat smacking you know going around and, and you know talking flat earth on on the streets you know fine whatever but i don't see anybody going around torah smacking anybody but i do see the people on the other side smacking us you know and and, and showing those fruits towards us and i think that's pretty telling I, I really do i really believe that that's showing the fruits i guess if you will 
uh, lack of a better term. Well, yeah, that to me that was just a uh, that, that was a very very ironic song that was sung, and I'm not going to get into that. But Tora, uh, I actually oh, like that song. Tora. I did too. Actually, I, I when I first saw the video, I was like, "Oh, this is great. Good job." And then, uh, I really, it's been stuck in my head actually. <laughs> but uh, for those of you uh, watching, um, if you guys appreciate. Uh, the conversation tonight and want to uh, give us some feedback if you could just give us a thumbs up or thumbs down on the uh, video um, and just let us know what you think it, and after the video ends you can actually come back later and, and comment below for now uh, the live chat's still available also rob for those who want to uh, support your ministry how can they do that yeah i just saw somebody in the chat room asking about i don't have a patreon account they're asking if i have one uh i probably should set one up but no i don't um but, you know, if, if their heart is to give, that's awesome. We definitely appreciate that for sure. Uh, they could go to virtualhousechurch.com. And on the left-hand menu, it says who we are. There's a second link down in, under the About Us section. You could click on that. Or you could go to robschannel.com, robschannel.com, and click on the About Rob uh, link. You know, okay. Either one of those would work. But yeah, and for those who have been supporters of us, both whether praying or financially or whatever, uh, I just want to publicly thank you, thank you, and express my extreme appreciation on behalf of both my wife and myself. Uh, literally, couldn't do it without you guys. I mean, seriously, it has been, you know, God has been amazing. Like when I took a stand for some of these things financially, it hurt us bad. I mean, it literally almost sent us into bankruptcy. I mean, that's it was really bad. Um, but in the, the season when it was the, the worst is when I was not committing, when I was straddling the fence, you know, mm -hmm. I was trying to kind of keep both. I, I wanted to hold on to the Bible and yet I wanted to hold on to my Star Trek universe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, and I'm trying desperately to make these two work together and they just won't. And I wasn't committing. And that's when we were having so much difficulty. But when I finally just said, you know what, let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, business wise, it didn't really it continued to kind of get bad, but like God just started opening up the windows of heaven and, you know, random people just supporting us, things happening, just his, oh. his favor. And I don't know how else to say it, but I have felt like I can experience the smile of God. That's what it feels like. Like, I feel like he's happy. I don't, I'm not saying I do it all right. I, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. Right. I'm just saying that I feel like he's pleased that I right took the stand that I took and that I went and did the things that I did. And he showed it to me through favor. I mean, I didn't solicit it. I didn't go out and start begging for money. Things just happened. And when we needed it most, there would just happen to be a package to show up in the mail. It would have, you know, exactly what we need. I know exactly what you mean, brother. I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes literally to the penny. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. To the penny. I mean, literally <laughs> just one, one quick example. Um, you know, the tests and stuff that we did, almost every test that we did cost at least $2,000, whether it was getting the equipment, the, the balloons or the traveling, the airfare, the rental cars, whatever. It always seemed to come up to at least $2,000. And it's not like I had that kind of money to throw around. So it was, it was a stretch, you know. And when we did the uh, Chicago Skyline test, that, that trip cost me 2500 bucks. And it was when I got back from that trip that I just finally committed. And it wasn't until I committed when I finally just said, you know what? Okay. And I made up, I think it was on flat earth and other hot potatoes was when I finally came out and said, okay, you know what? I just, I just believe it. Um, we got, I went to my PO box and there was uh, like three checks in the mail and it came up to a little over $3,000. So I got back to 2,500 that I spent on the trip and the extra that was left over a couple of days later, our washing machine blew up and flooded our apartment. So I actually had to get a new washing machine and clean up the, you know, the issues in the apartment and it covered that. So nice. it, wow. it, it was like a double whammy, but it was there to provide for what we had spent and in advance for what we were going to need. It was just there, you know, and that's what he's done. So for those of you out there who have listened to the Holy Spirit that prompted you to do th these things at the exact time that you didn't know it, but the Holy Spirit knew we needed it, you know, thank you. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Praise the Lord. So and, much uh, that they made business cards, actually. They hand them out and they uh, leads people to your, your, uh, your flat earth website as a, uh, as a as a part of their ministry. They hand out your cards. So, <laughs> all right, right on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm assuming everybody in here, well, not everybody, but most people probably know uh, Rob's channel. Just type in Rob Skiba. You'll find it pretty easily. Uh, any website that you want to share? Is it testingtheglobe.net or .com? Uh, that's a dot com. Yeah, no, testing okay. the testing the global. Uh, it's a very great website to share uh, flat earth information on. It's got so many different references. Uh, most of the different verses. I think is it. Mo I think you have most of the verses up there on one of the, the subsections. I know I've used that as a reference many times myself. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I mean, it's weird because, you know, that was actually a first run. It was like it's not an exhaustive list, but it's an extensive list. But it was just like right just off the top of my head, just kind of doing you know, recalling verses that I was aware of and then looking up other things like pillars of the earth and whatnot and finding them, you know, uh, other people have done similar things that I think they're up to like 200 and something verses now. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are a little more obscure though. I will say, you know, with uh, yeah. the ones that they're doing like the 200. Some of them like, are a stretch. They're a stretch for sure. Some of them are stretching, but part of it is you don't understand what the person's thinking when they like, like I could put a scripture, I, I don't think I use these scriptures on there, but I think it's like 70 something times the phrase in the earth is used. Mm. And, you know, King James usually gets it right. Um, other translations will say on the earth. That's not correct. Um, you know, the, the, the letter bait, when before a word as a prefix, it means in. So it'll be bait ha arets, right? Uh, arets meaning earth and the letter hey meaning the. So in the earth is a that's a proper way of translating that hebrew word baha, baha aretz uh so, but i mean what are we talking about are we talking about troglodytes is, is everybody on the earth a cave dweller or is that an appropriate word because the earth is in an enclosed system it's mm -hmm. an enclosed system so you said they're walking around in the earth right it's only english translators that say well it must mean on the earth and they 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 violated the rules of hebrew translation and wrote on the earth for Baha Aretz. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I forgot why I was mentioning that. I think I had a point, but it, <laughs> done that so I think, yeah, I just talk this adding up the amount of the amount of scripture that supports it. Oh yeah. yeah what, if you want to dive. Yeah. Yeah. So some some of those two hundred, you know, I haven't looked at every one of them that they've put up, but maybe verses like that. So somebody just reads a verse where it says something like in the earth, they're like, how is that a flat earth? They don't get it, you know. They're they're, they're yeah. missing the 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 nuance of what is being said. There is in the earth is the phrase that we're, we're focusing on, but because it didn't say the earth is flat, or you know, they're looking for the phrase flat earth or earth is flat. Right, um, right. They're not going to find that, but all of the descriptions that are used really only lead you to that conclusion. Yeah, yeah. If you're honest with the text. Right. So the ones that I use were were more overt and and as opposed to some of the more the, the, some of the um more subtle ones i guess you might say mm -hmm. but there's a lot up there my the i've got a lot of websites so i always just i made one website called robschannel.com and that's sort of like the hub that will get you everywhere else so if you, okay <laughs> you want to see Great. the other ones just go to robschannel.com and you can get the other ones from there awesome awesome and brothers and sisters if you have not subscribed to brother justin's channel it is called christian truthers um, all you have to do is if you're subscribed to this channel, just go to my recommended list. He's on there as well. Um, but, uh, I, I think it's, uh, unfortunately I could keep going like another hour here, honestly, but I think we got to go ahead and start wrapping it up. Uh, e either one of you have some final thoughts. I know I've got one, just one scripture I want to uh, share before we wrap it up. Any, any of the final thoughts for you brothers? For me, I, I would just say, look, like we talked about earlier, the more you get to know our God, Yahuwah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you, you realize how much he has done for us, how much love he has shown us, I, I kind of think we owe him, you know, to love him back. And that's all he asks. He said, hey, you know, I've done all this for you. Can you just, like, appreciate what I've done? Mm -hmm. And by the way, the way, you know, God is saying, the way I receive love is if you just do what I told you to do, because I told you to do these things or not to do these things because I love you. I know how I made your body. I know how I made a pig's body. I know how they're not compatible and how it's it's not meant for you. You know, he didn't make dietary laws to be a big meanie, you know, or any of the other laws. You know, and when it comes to like um, the seat seat, right? You know, one of these guys call me tassel boy. I'm like, really? <laughs> tassel boy? Um, you know, I get on to people like him will get on to me and then Torah people will get on to me because they don't see my my seat seats. I'm not one of these guys that have them hanging down on my knees, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like mine. 
mine are typically, I don't know if you can see this, right here. Mm -hmm. It's wrapped around my belt loop and tucked into my pocket. Yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. and so, because they're not for show. They're yeah. they're not they're not for you guys. It's for me. Exactly. You know? Yeah. I, the purpose of the seat seat is to remind me to obey God. So right. I know that I have them on. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and when I when I was looking into the issue of whether or not I should do it in the first place, I was like, well, the purpose of the seat seat is to remember to obey God. Right. Uh, well, I've got the Holy Spirit in me. Why do I need to? Why do I need tassels hanging from my clothes? You know, that's kind of my attitude for the first few years. Um, then it was like year three or four or something like that. We're looking at that. I think it's numbers 15. Uh, and it's a commandment that mm -hmm. was never, never repealed, you know? Right. So we're like, well, and I can say what it's done for me. Um, yeah. Is that, uh, you know, the purpose is to remember the commandments. Well, that's on my mind a lot anyway, but, you know, growing up in new England and growing up in a military environment and, you know, I, I had a, a bad mouth, <laughs> you know, and yeah. frank, frankly, I struggle with it even still. Yeah, we're both uh, former Marines, so we hear you. Okay, okay you get it. I mean, the okay. F word is an adjective, right? It is. Right. It really is. And, and nobody thinks anything of it, frankly. I mean, everybody throws yeah. it around. It's just a, it's an adjective for everything. So, you know, I, I find my that, that is something I struggle with. You know, uh, especially on Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. people see uh, people think I'm ugly on Facebook. They don't. It's the stuff that they don't see. You know, <laughs> you know like well, I'm not proud of it. I'm just saying. Right. Um, uh, but when I have these on, it's kind of like like mom following you around. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, you know, if you're if your mom's following you around, you're, you're not going to say things. You know, you're not going to look at things. You're not going to you're going to act differently because you got a, an accountability thing going on there. Right. And even though we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. For me, the conscious act of putting those on me, knowing what they represent, mm -hmm. it, it's just, it, it has helped me uh, yep. in that regard. I mean, that's just one specific example. So, but look, I have recognized how much he loves me and he's constantly showing me how much he loves me. So it's the least I can do is to tr try to do the things that he's not for salvation, not to be saved. I got that covered. It, it's because he, that's what he desires for me. Right. You know, and like we talked about earlier, I've experienced nothing but extreme joy mm -hmm. by keeping the Sabbath and the feasts. And, you know, I feel healthier now that I'm eating the way the Bible tells me that I should eat. Um, you know, so why wouldn't I do it? You know, I, I guess that's my parting words is like, if he's done so much for you, is it, the least you can do is like maybe do what he wants you to do? I, I so agree with you, Rob. And if I could just sum that up with, you know, does everything we have to do about be about us, what we get out of it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, what about Abba? What does he want? Right? What he's always wanted from the beginning, you know? So well said. Well said, brother. Well said. Yeah. Well, Justin, any uh, parting words of That's, I, I'm glad that that he kind of brought it back around to that because it, it kind of goes back to what one of the things I kind of brought up earlier. And that's, um, you know, when this all started for me, it was just, and it still is, it still is just a joy. And it, I guess, I guess I analytically have a hard time understanding the, the, the so-called debate because I just, I just, I just love, I love uh, walking in his ways. Um, I, I want more of it. And I know that I know most of you, if not most of you in the chat and, and who are watching this, you guys love him too, and you love his ways, and and that's why you're seeking and searching and and, and watching, and you know, uh, for I just I just wanted to confirm that that's that's all this is is we love him and we trust him, and like Rob said, sometimes we don't always understand why Dad tells us to do something until we grow up. But we just trust him, right? By faith, we just do what he says, and we find that it's it's um, it's either a blessing now, and we get to experience that, or it will be a blessing later, and we're going to have faith in that, and that's that's why we're doing this. And um, all, all we can ask is that uh, those who disagree or don't understand uh, can just show us, um, you know, the same grace that that we try and show each other as well, and um, and just just really read it. Just actually at least read it, at least read Deuteronomy and, and see how much of this really applies. It's, it's not going to be life changing. Uh, I mean, like a mind blowing stuff. It's not, you know, like Zitzit actually is one of the, is one of the few 
uh, outwardly physical things that you'll actually uh, probably change about yourself other than maybe like, you know, not eating pork and shellfish anymore. If you really, if you really get into it, this, it's really, it really becomes quite simple once you really study it out and, and just meditate on it. So um, anyway, I just want to encourage you, um, anyone out there watching, if, if you, you know, are, are being told that this is some kind of bondage and that it's impossible and all of the, the typical straw man arguments that we hear, uh, I just wanted to testify. And I think Rob and Adam both, we just want to testify that, to the joy and peace and the fact that that's not true. It, it, the Holy Spirit, that's why we have, that's why he gave them to us, man, to, to give us the power of grace. And so uh, just wanted to, to just encourage y'all to, to pray on it and look at it closely before you just start attacking people. Um, that, that's pretty much it. We love you guys regardless, and we forgive you guys regardless. Um, and I just wanted to make that known as well. Oh, yeah, you're right. And um, forgiveness is key. And I think we both forgive the individual that um, did what they did to us. Uh, again, the only thing I ask personally, because I know you're going to be watching this, is to please uh, blur out my wife and my children's faces uh, out of the video that you made, please. Um, but otherwise, I forgive you. Um, but you're right, Justin. It, it ha I just want to finish up with a few things, and, and I've got a few scriptures that I want to share. Um, you know, in Revelation, I think it's 18, it tells us to come out of her uh, for, you know, come out of her, my people, so you don't partake in her plagues. And what I've found, you know, as far as just testifying myself, and again, a lot of you guys know my testimony, where I came from. Well, Justin and I, we have a very similar testimony. We both were definitely the prodigal children. Uh, we did as we please, and we we did a lot of what we what we wanted, what we what we wanted to do, our own will. Um, and and just going from thirsting after all that the world has has to offer to thirsting after Abba's ways is the the only thing for that is obviously belief in Yeshua HaMashiach and, and the Holy Spirit that he's given us to to thirst after those things. Just like we read earlier in Ezekiel uh, 11 and uh, was it? Yeah, 11 and 36 about, you know, when he gave us that spirit that it would be so that we could, you know, have that spirit of grace to, to actually follow his ways and, and walk in his statutes and his judgments. And um, I'm not perfect and I still stumble, but it is a blessing to thirst after his ways. And I just hope that anyone out there that has an opposing view, just like Justin said, just continue to test it. Um, and I, I just, I pray that uh, he reveals it to you in due time. But I want to go over a couple scriptures, um, you know, and, and it does relate to the end times. There are a lot of scriptures we, we talked about earlier about the, the Apocrypha. Um, I, I think they were hidden for many reasons. Number one, the father said that they were going to be hidden. So everything's according to his will. So it's not like it got past him, you know, um, but there's some scriptures I want to share with you, and it's interesting. There may, you know, there may be, I hate to say it, but there may be some sort of reward for keeping his commandments. I, he said it before himself that, you know, uh, the commands would, would keep them safe. You know, it's just how it is. It's how it was back in the days of the Israelites. As soon as they stopped keeping the commandments, guess what? They weren't safe. Uh, this is Second Baruch. Chapter 32, and I'm going to read just, I'm going to go through a couple of these really fast. Uh, but as for you, if you prepare in your hearts so as to sow in them the fruits of the law, it shall protect you in that time in which the mighty one is to shake the whole creation. And we know this is yet to yet to come. Second Ezra 16. Here, my this is the very last uh, section of verses in this book. Here, my elect, says the Lord, behold, the days of tribulation are at hand, and I will deliver you from them. It's the very same thing we see in uh, Daniel 12. Do not fear or doubt, for God is your guide. You who keep my commandments and precepts, says the Lord, do not let your sins pull you down or your iniquities prevail over you. Woe to those who are choked by their sins and overwhelmed by their iniquities as a field is choked with underbrush and it, its path overwhelmed with thorns so that no one can pass through. It is shut off and given up to be consumed by fire. And uh, one last verse. This is kind of just really just sums up, honestly, the entire evening tonight for me. This is what I was saying earlier when we read Matthew, uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 19, where Yeshua said that uh, he who uh, keeps the commands will be greatest. He who does not keep the commands and teaches men so will be least. Well, it's funny. It's interesting. Paul says the same thing in different words. Sort of, this is 2 Timothy 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There's that word again. This is lawlessness. So Paul's preached the same thing. 
This is where uh, parallels Matthew 5. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. Now this is where we all need to take heed and be long-suffering with our brothers and sisters if they don't see eye to eye with us on certain topics. And this goes for both sides. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle all, unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that impose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to acknowledging the truth, the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So, as we all know, God gives the eyes, not us. Not There's no crafty debate we can come up with to just change someone's mind uh it comes from god proverbs 16 says the very same thing god establishes the 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 thoughts and the and the answer of the tongue it comes from him so let us all just be patient with one another and you know the i think the attacks need to stop so i think with that being said i think we've covered it pretty well tonight so in to sum it all up you know peter warned us of these things of 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 what was to come from those taking Paul's words out of context? Uh, it was created what forty thousand denominations, and uh, and here we are at the end, where uh, you know we have a cesspool of of beliefs and understandings, and you've got brothers uh, against brother, just like Yeshua said it was going to happen. So, with that being said, brothers and sisters, thanks for joining us another week here at the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live streams. Uh, next week is a is a pretty big week. It's the one year. It's gonna be the one year anniversary of of starting these live streams, and uh, we're gonna have most of the uh, presenters on here. I'll be here. Justin will be here. Uh, Sean Griffin will be here. Ken Heidebrecht will be here, and I believe uh, Brother Gavin will be here. I'm not sure about Tim. So I think most of us will be here next week. And actually, I don't think we know what the topic is yet. We had a topic, and then I think we decided that we best to put that on hold for now. Uh, so I think we're just going to continue to pray on it and, and, uh, we may just have an open floor and just maybe just Q and a and, and just hanging out with y'all. But yeah, next week's the one year uh, anniversary. So make sure you, uh, you stop in with us, but make sure you subscribe to brother Rob Skiba, subscribe to brother Justin at Christian truthers. And, uh, if, if you just stumbled on this live stream by chance, uh, go ahead and subscribe here to the parable of the vineyard. But, uh, with that, uh, I think we should just close with a little prayer. Uh, anybody feel led to? Can we go not, again? I'll say, if not, I'll, I'll go. Yeah, if not, I'll go. But, I'll, uh, I'll pray. Let me pray again. I want to do it. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I, I, go I, 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 I was so excited. My voice just cracked. Nice. <laughs> do you want to go? You can go. <laughs> no, go ahead. Okay. All right. I want to, you know. Oh, Father. Oh, we just praise you. We just lift you up. Magnify your name, Yahuwah, the Most High. What a blessing you are to us. Thank you for revealing your ways to us and showing us what pleases you, Father. It's our delight to, to just attempt, to just to just seek you, to just try and be more like Yeshua HaMashiach, our example, our, our shepherd, our savior, our Messiah, Father. Thank you for the blessings you've bestowed upon us tonight with all the people who joined us in the chat. And for those people who will be watching, thank you for the blessing of their fellowship. And thank you especially tonight for allowing Brother Rob Skiba to join us and share his, his testimony with us and his experience. Father. We just want truth, and you know that. We just pray that your spirit would be with everyone tonight and those that will be watching this later on in the recording, that your spirit would be with them and help us all to be guided into understanding. In Yeshua HaMashiach's mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.